I'm Elisa Richards, chairperson of the Utah Geological Survey Board. I'd like to welcome everybody, and I would like to call this meeting of the UGS Board Order. It is now 8.30 a.m. on April 13, 2022. This meeting is held in person and virtually with Google Meet. In compliance with Utah's open meeting laws, this meeting is being recorded in its entirety. The recording is classified as a pub public record, and the following board members are in attendance. Elisa Richards, Dave Garbrett, Rick Chestnut, Ken Flack, Becky Hammond, Sam Quigley, and Riley Brinkerkoff. Um, do we have anybody that's absent? I don't think so. We're all here. Seven. I mean, the only person is the is Tom Pat. Tom Pat is ex officio. Okay. Yeah, but he hasn't been explicit. Mm -hmm. But he is invited. Okay. Um, the following individuals representing the Utah Geological Survey and the Department of Natural Resources are in attendance. Bill Keach, Division Director, Mike Hillen, Deputy Director, Jody Patterson, Financial Manager, and Cheryl Gustin, Board Secretary, and Steve Bollinger. That's right. And Holly Brown. Holly Brown as well. Um, at present, we welcome all visitors and interested persons at this time. And as a courtesy to everyone participating in this meeting, at this time, we ask for all cell phones, pagers, and other electronic devices to be turned off or changed to silent mode. Board motions and votes must be reflected in the minutes reported by an individual board member. And let us now proceed with the agenda. Okay. And the first action is the approval of the board minutes. That's right. From our January 19th uh, meeting. So I move to approve the minutes. And did anybody have any issues with the minutes? Okay, I move to approve the board minutes from January 19th. 2022. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Great. The minutes from the January 19th, 2022 meeting are approved. And we need a formal approval of all the projects, correct? Correct. And, and just so you know, I I confused Riley, I think, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had one coming yesterday. And I sent out last night, and, and the main, and then I added it to this list. I, I have an updated printout it's in my car. I can get it later. Where I added that last one. The main reason I wanted to add it is just if you wanted to look at it before we did it this morning, you'd have a chance to read it. And quite a few of you responded that you had approved already. But it's um, that's the uh, that's this one uh, about the. Mountain pinion unit for monitoring. Yeah. One. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I had a couple questions about that too. Um, so if I understand it correctly, it's kind of a water monitoring associated with treatment on that pinion juniper. Why is that UGS and not like um, DQ or something of that nature? It's actually part of because um, the, the Division of Water Quality, which is part of DEQ, mm -hmm. hired us to do it for that. Okay. So that's how that comes. To, so they are the division one colony is in charge of it, but they don't have the staff to do it. Gotcha. So they ask us to do it. But um, we have staffing issues, right, with all the state map and whatnots. We do. So does that overstretch us by taking their work? No. We, Janae has been doing this for Janae Wallace, one of our senior scientists. She has been doing this for a long time. So it's better, it's better to have the on, people at the underground have that kind of the continuity. And if I remember correctly, it's part of an overall bigger project, and there's I think two or three different funders that kind of yeah. come together into this one. This is one component of that. I don't remember all of them. The watershed restoration yeah. initiative, something that yeah, you and R established years ago, and ongoing effort. So we have a gentleman, Tyler. When I remember Tyler's at he works for DNR with this watershed restoration initiative. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But it's, a big, it's a big project. They do some of the controlled burns. They reseed the grass after fires. Um, it's part of that bigger effort. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. And this one actually technically doesn't need to be approved because we're only matching it by $5,000. And I think, don't we say greater than 5000 We do. <laughs> so I, I mean. <laughs> It's kind of funny. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Well, it was equal to or greater than. I, think I, I actually, I think I have it open here for this, for that very point. I think, <laughs> greater than five. Greater than five. And it's actually, yeah, it's actually five. If you look at the top there, it says 
greater than 5,000. Yes. <laughs> but then uh, it, it also showed uh, approval required was checked on the. Yes. Yeah. That's the mistake. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I actually did the approval. Sure. And we, we'll take your approval. Yeah. <laughs> we always share it with you anyways. Yeah, we, we, you, yeah. You'll get a lot of you say, just so you know. It's right on the border. Not so yeah. not so if it goes a dollar more, we're in yeah. <laughs> we want to be in trouble. So anyway, yeah, these are the ones. So I, I added that one last night. I figured, that otherwise it's not till August that we get your official. Yeah. Well, a lot of them came through. I looked at it this morning, I put it this morning. There were a lot of approvals. That They're came already approved. Yeah. So, anyway, yes. Yeah, so. Okay. Well, then I, I I'll will, make a motion to approve that. To formally approve all the project proposals since our last meeting? Yes. Yeah. I'll second it. I think you need a vote. Okay. Let, um, all those who, all those who, um, vote yay to approve the projects, um, project proposals from the last meeting. Say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And it's unanimous that all of the project proposals from our last meeting have been approved. And from that, we're moving to the proper floor discussion. And I think all of, there it is. Mark, Mike, do you want to take this one? Sure. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Riley and Becky, are you familiar with the Crawford Award? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so we put out our call for <clears throat> nominations to the staff just last week. Um, the nomination period will be about a month, so they're all due by May 6th, at which point uh, Bill will forward you up to three uh, of the nominations for your consideration. Um, we'd like to give you a couple of weeks. Um, in the last couple of years, we've done this um, remotely. Uh, in the past, they've been considered at the meeting. And there's been some discussion, but the last couple of years we've done it remotely. Uh, so we'll continue in that mode this year. <clears throat> so we're aiming for a selection by around May 20th. And then uh, we're planning on having our annual June picnic uh, again, which we haven't done the last couple of years. We, we did one in the fall uh, last year, but the year before we didn't do one at all. So we have that picnic scheduled for Thursday, June 9th, and we'll present. We'd like to present the award then, and it'd be great to have uh, as many board members at the picnic as possible, or at least one to make the award presentation. <laughs> so some of you have been before, I know. Yeah. And, uh, Again, the award, we, one of you, generally the chair, if you can come, if not, whoever you choose. I think my idea yeah. will hand it out. That it was, we did it last year um, up at Canyon Park. It was we great. did. Yeah, it was great. So Canyon Park is, but like I said, we moved it, you know, COVID. Yes, sir. We're trying to get back on schedule. And so this will be our regular schedule. Okay. I had an earlier slide just, oh. I just put up a slide just make sure that you're we, we scheduled those dates when i was in our last meeting so it was just a reminder that we're still targeting those dates for the field trip so we have bonneville saw flats i don't know these are the only pictures i could find in my collection <laughs> Marapolites and anyway great salt lake okay Come in, you know, if they're outside. We only had a couple of days. In terms of retirements, so I got retirements. Um, Bob B, for those who know Bob, June 1st, he's giving us, I'm going out the door today. <laughs> but he's also said, I would love to have you, I would love to keep working on a part time basis. I, I don't know how many of you know, but Bob moved to Fort Bragg, California in 2020 kind of December 2020, first part of 2021, he came to me and said, hey, bought a house. <laughs> I don't know if I can still work. And it was, it was kind of funny because at the time I said to this, I went to our HR folks and I says, is there any prohibition against someone living out of state and working for them? They said, no, no, good. Can he take his, his, his state-owned work equipment? Yeah, no problem. 
<laughs> so, so, you know, because I, I was certain there was going to be rules against this type of stuff. There are rules now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Bob, Bob got out. We were, I think we tested that first curve. <laughs> where that curve went out. Um, so, but anyway, he plans to continue to work part time for us. His mega slide. We just reviewed his 151 page tome on the mega slides. If you're familiar with that work, and it's kind of his big comprehensive piece of the three slides now. So we're thinking about printing it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, he'd like to have it available for sale at you know like national park bookstores and that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's a nice piece of work. I I, I spent I think Saturday afternoon reading it <laughs> to get through it. So anyway, we're going to miss Bob. Um, <clears throat> Kent Brown, who I should probably, I'll put him in here. He's also mapping senior GIS analyst. When I started here three year, plus years ago, he walked and said, Bill, I am retiring July 1st in 2022 because <laughs> I will be eligible for my Social Security and my home will be paid off. <laughs> And he's going to make it in July. August 1st will be actually his official day. But he's holding pretty true to that. And Grant Willis, you know, we replaced Grant with Stream as the new program manager. Part of our thought process there was that it gives Grant time to mentor Stephen. Grant's been running that program for 29 years. There's so much institutional knowledge and lore built up in, in Grant. I just, we just didn't want it to walk out the door. And Grant wants to do the same thing, but he hasn't given us a date, but sometime this year. At least that's the reason. But he also wants to come back and keep working. You know, most of these mappers, they, they love what they do. So our big hole is going to need to find replacements. I have asked Stefan, don't hesitate, start advertising the same to replace these folks. So we're going to get after that. And, and I just put up a little graphic that all of those are in my mapping program. And there's one more who may retire in the, in, the, in the next few months. So we've got some serious people that are with many, many years of experience. Did I forget anybody? Retired? Okay. Well, Linda. Linda. And then Linda. <laughs> then our account tech. Um, she and Jody keep us on the straight and narrow. I like we, we, I had a question from the auditor for DNR the other day, and it was an email he sent to everybody, all the directors, all the divisions. And I said, Jody and, and, and Linda keep us on the straight and narrow, and he goes, yes, they do. <laughs> they are really good, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what the two of them have done since I have been here. They're really good. And we're going to miss Linda. We are. And so... But you've got a list of applicants now, and we'll start vetting some and do it through and see what we can find. Um, new hires. So I've asked them, they're, they're coming up. So Subi, so Subi got a call probably 10 minutes ago. So we probably, <laughs> he seemed a little scrap, you know. But how many weeks ago did you start? Two weeks ago? Just in the second week. Second week. He was brought in to help with the mapping program and be a GIS analyst there. So he'll be your not a permanent hire yet, but anyway, but we're glad to have Subi. Yeah. So I did so for Subi's benefit, we we have a citizen advisory board. If you're running who these folks all are. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we meet with them about four times a year. And they give us pretty good advice. <laughs> and we try and follow it. So anyway, just wanted you to meet them and say hello. Welcome. Oh, okay. Skating is our, she's also, you've been here a month or two, right? Yeah, I started on Pi Day. Pi Day. So, about a month then. So, Katie's working here in the core center. Um, we, we met Katie last week, or not, or not last week, last January, I think it was her first day or two. She's the new core center manager. And so we have Katie and then Skatie. <laughs> yeah. So the boss doesn't get confused. <laughs> yeah. But Skatie, we're, we're glad to have Skatie here as well. So, yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. 
And we had one that just started working for Steve yesterday. Or Monday. But she has class today. She's a student. She's at Weaver State. She's in class all morning, she said. So I guess it's good to see her name. One other, someone who assigned our job offer is Jeremiah Bernal. I don't know if you, did I skip something? No. I'm oh, no, sorry, I just wondering if, we, if you wanted us to stay in here. You can stay if you want. Do you have any birthday classes? <laughs> <laughs> she goes, I'm dirty. I said, means you're working. <laughs> I was like, ah, like, oh, you guys are going to make me talk in front of people? <laughs> no, 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 we're good. Um, we made this little history. We have money to work on the Bonneville salt flats. And it was initially going to be five million on the promise of 45 million from the feds, which never showed up. So it got parsed down a year or two ago down to a million that we can keep is what they call non-lapsing. So we finally, it took a lot, it was like herding cats. <laughs> we had to get intrepid potash, we had to get the BLM, had to get the U of U, had to get us, came to us all in fun on how, what do we want to do with that million dollars? So we finally came up with a plan and got everybody on board. And Jeremiah is just, I was at his thesis defense a few weeks ago, finishing his PhD, and he's work, been working the Bonneville Salt Flats for his PhD under Professor Dr. or Brenda Bowen at the U. She's assistant department chair up there too. But Jeremiah, he's just passionate about the salt flats. And so one of the big things everybody wants to do is to pay for extra salt radar. So we contracted with Intrepid and in February, they finished in March, they did a lay down of 100,000 tons above what they were required to do according to the BLM contract. And so they got paid 500,000 of that money. The balance of the money we're going to use to study the effects of extra lay down in groundwater in the Bonneville salt flats. So prior to the lay down this year, last fall, we laid out additional sensors in boreholes on the salt flats and to measure water flow the whole nine yards. So Jeremiah's been helping as part of this thesis to get all that out. And Hugh Hurlow and his group have been working on it. So we'll kind of wrap that up, bringing Jeremiah on board in August to work for us to finish that, that research. Because again, being shorthanded as we are, um, we can use some of that million bucks to fund him and possibly one other master's school. This gives you an overview. But Jeremiah will be coming on in, in August. So Holly and I went out with him and a reporter from the Associated Press a few weeks ago. So that was a good visit. And so, anyway, things are going on there. So Jeremiah's at that fill. And then I just put up here positions to, to fill in the near future. Um, <laughs> we got to get a financial analyst to replace Linda. We need another mapper to replace Bob. When Kent retires, we're kicking around the idea, do we have somebody else that's already in the group assume what he's been doing and then hire someone that knows 3D? Because a lot of the USGS funding is starting to come. We'll talk about that later. There's a, an increased emphasis on subsurface work. So we might bring a person in to do subsurface in that regard. Um, hydrogeologist um, to replace Stefan <laughs> moving over. And that hydrogeologist and offer has been accepted and will start in May. I can't give you the person's name because they haven't. They work for another state agency and they haven't given notification yet. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be happy to tell you. <laughs> Is that too much information? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think so. But they I, I saw the person yesterday. They were here and they hadn't notified yet. Um, and you'll see this, this will be mentioned a couple of times that we got funding for a new hydro position. And our intent is to split that into two positions and use outside funding to pick up the other half. So we're, we're and we have a, another person who's actually already accepted one of those, but also hasn't given up. So, so. You know, we're coming along and then we're gonna do, look to hire a new weapons mapper. And whatever else I've probably forgotten, but yeah, you know, things are a change up there. So, Oh, and I, this was just an update. Um, 
We'd ask you to waive Don DeBlue's requirement. We finally got it approved by DHLA. So he'll be a senior geologist. I think he was supposed to start this last pay period, if I remember. Was it March? Have you seen it yet? I know DHR approved it. So that was just a brief. So that takes us to where we're going to kind of jump into kind of our little unit. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, Sue. And I understand you've jumped already into the Ogden map. Yep. So you're making great progress. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Bye, Skatie. Uh, you bring our new GIS and I have not done geological apps before. There's a bit of a learning from the areas jumps by the end. So I'm going to shift gears here now. Is that okay? Any other questions about what we've done so far? Feel free to chime in. Okay. Um, so I've probably got more slides than we've had before, but each time I say a, a note to the program manager, is there anything you would like me to say to the board on your behalf? Send me a couple of paragraphs. It, it just seems to be getting from each one. <laughs> I get these longer and longer paragraphs. And uh, so we have a lot going on. Um, Earth MRI is a USGS program, stands for Earth Mapping Resources Initiative. This is an effort to try and figure out where the critical minerals and other needed minerals are across the country. And the federal government has thrown a significant amount of money at this. We'd ask for a new minerals related geologist in our budget proposals. And we got turned down. We're, we're, we're going to still go and try and find one and bring them in. We think we've got the funding internally to do that. But a couple of projects, the money from these is interesting. It comes. They say we'll give you all the money with no match requirement, but then they ask you how much match you're going to provide. <laughs> <laughs> and so we picked a number of 20%. And so we got a $300,000 grant to do the first one, which is geochemical sampling of the West Desert. And we'll kick in 20 to 20% of that to get this go. But that was awarded um, a couple weeks ago. In the last few weeks, we just got notified on that one. And then there was a second project called RE, Rare Earth Elements, if you don't know what RE is, on the Phosphoria Formation. And that actually covers multiple states. And so the Idaho Geological Survey, Claudio Verde, State Joseph, they're going to be the primary PIs, but they're going to spread money across all of the states here. It will be a big joint project to work on that. So that's 79,000 over three years. So that's, that's pretty good. So we're excited. Um, related to Earth MRI, we got a call about a month or two ago. Utah's had some areas that have been lacking in LIDAR and crowd bank. The West Desert in particular has been a big gap because it's hard to find any real public, let me back to commercial interest that would like to help fund getting LIDAR out in the West Desert. And so the USGS called us and says, hey, we're gonna, we got a project. We've got some money from through Earth MRI, which is not the usual place to get MR or LIDAR money. And they're willing to basically finish off most of those white areas in the state for us over the next couple of years. So that's going to be a big deal. Yeah. And Steve will probably tell you he's excited for LIDAR on the West Desert because we know there's a lot of faults out there, right? Steve got closed in on it, but that last bit has been extremely difficult to get funding for. We just don't have a lot of good detail to share it. And some of it is on like the proving grounds and the, the military. Mm -hmm. And they're hoping to get permission to fly those areas as well, which would be a great benefit to fill in our pictures. LIDAR up in the UNA area, the US Forest Service is going to contribute some funds. To help them. So, anyway, we're, we're excited to see what they do. The other piece of this is they're going to do. Grab mag, so they don't have enough money to do everything. But there are some mining companies that have done some of their own that are talking about maybe trading something in towards this. So we've been, you see a J in the front of that? They got different proposed projects, outlines of A through J. And we think we're converged close to what that green one looks like. We meet every two weeks on Monday afternoon, trying to figure out where we want to go and exactly. But 
This is targeted for both gravity and magnetics on some mineral districts that we think along that swap. So this would be a great addition as well for us. So Stephanie Mills from our energy minerals, she's gonna she's leading our effort toward with the money's part of it. And Steve's jumping in on the LIDAR side. So that's a good one. Um, Iron Mountain, <clears throat> and if we, I think we may have talked about this. Department of Energy is funding a project down in, uh, in Iron County, which is that's west of Cedar City, to look at um, could they combine, they're, they're starting to mine Oregon down there, and then they got to process it, which then requires natural gas in the, in the heat and in the and the refinement process, which then a byproduct is CO2. Another product is, is helium, I call it blue helium. And I actually got contacted last year, over a year now, by a guy in California who was really wanted to push this thing along. And he was talking about he looking for carbon sequestration. So I pushed him into you, Brian McPherson. He's been the manager of the, what they call the Southwestern Partnership for probably 15 years on carbon sequestration. And so Brian got with him and then they got the company and then they went to the Dewey and they got the grant. And it blossomed from this small idea that we can find a way to sequester carbon up there, CO2 up there. We might be able to find a way to produce helium and get the iron ore out. But that's like a win, 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 win. And we're going to have the official kickoff for this, I think, May 13th in the Cedar City area. But it's 192,000. They've actually picked up some old seismic data and we processed that. But they're targeting the Navajo sandstone. There's more details. I'm not giving you all the details that are in the right if you got. I'm just trying to get some of the highlights here. But it'll be a good project. Yeah. Um, I guess you have the Navajo sandstone is probably the primary reservoir we're targeting. So I like that for. That's Mike Danovich's group. Eugene Samansky works for Mike. Um, um, the $192,000 we spent on uh, mostly is it, is it research money? And that, yeah, that's much, not an two, that's how much to us, right? I think if I remember right. And that's oh, going to be, right. it's going to be spread out over three, two and a half years. And we're going to go try and characterize that. We're, we talked about even re-entering some old boreholes, yeah. but pulling out the log data, because there are some oil exploration wells that penetrate the them. Yeah. Okay. So if we can pull the log data and do some characterization and modeling of the Navajo, that's where that primary effort. Okay. Yep. And they've done a little bit of field work already going down to look at some places. And so there's not a lot of you know, Navajo outcrop in the Cedar City area. You know, you get down to Snow Canyon, there's other places you can go. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're going to go after. And also to look at the seal rocks. Okay. Um, and I, there's a lot more detail in your handout if you want all the details, but we have geothermal projects going. I'll talk about one here in a couple of minutes. Core CM, which is Critical Minerals Project. This is stuff that Stephanie's working on. Cane Creek, that's one that Mike and his group are working on out by just south of Green River, south of East Green River. That project's still working. That's in cooperation with the University of Utah. Um, Gold Hill, that's a project that, St again, Stephanie's working on. And then on Friday, um, Steve can maybe talk about this, but we put in a grant to do data preservation. We do this every year. And Steve and his group, Steve works pretty, very, not pretty, very collaboratively with the other programs inside of UGS on how do we get funding to preserve a lot of our data? How do we convert paper data to digital data? How do we convert log imagery? How do we get stuff? You want to say anything, Steve? Well, the 245 is the new funding. And yeah, it's the new funding. It's actually double that because there's a 50% cost share from us. Yeah. And so it will uh, allow the purchase of a new electric order selector uh, in the core center to, uh, to replace the old one that's seeing its age. And then a new microscope and then several other different 
projects with geologic maps, critical minerals, uh, aerial photography, and also to archive a lot of the products that the retiring mappers have collected in their offices over the years, field books, uh, draft notes, maps, all those kind of things uh, will also be in this project. I think we hired a new technician to work with in our paleo room because we've got Martha who handled got stacks of paper and she's 39 years in. Jim, he's just a few years out of retirement. I mean, we're, we're trying to race ahead to preserve a way out before again that institutional knowledge walks out the door. So we got, like I said, we got a couple of critiques, but, but this is a nice one. We got an email on Friday. Actually, emailed to me, Steve. Went to my spam folder. I didn't even know we'd gotten it. Oh, no. <laughs> I got a text from Vandenberg that Steve, Steve and Stephanie work, Mills worked together to, to write that proposal. And we got it every time we asked for it. So, so that was that was pretty cool. Um, usually, so I, go ahead. usually for Utah, we're in the top three um, highest funded amounts for data preservation. They write good proposals. Uh, you know, I meet mean, on a fairly regular basis with the state geologists from around the country. We have every few months we have meetings. It's, it's, a, it's an association like the AAPG, Association of American State Geologists. And one of them would cut kind of on a rant from one state about not getting any preservation money. But if someone told me they don't write a very good grant proposal. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it says a lot about Steve and Stephanie and, and the work that they do and the kind of work they deliver, you know, they recognize that it's good what we do. Also, because, you know, with COVID winding down, we're starting to get back out on the road. You know, we had almost all of our, I don't know that we did any out of state travel for about two years. Yeah, you didn't send anybody to the meeting last year. And we are this year. That's gone. So we got to, we're going to get out Related to that, they also, UGA has a book on the UN Basin and Green River coming out. And you have several authors on that. Uh, Ryan Dahl did a great job. Yeah. Um, my grandpa oh, yeah. The papers in that. Um, UGA has some stuff in that. Good stuff. Yeah. So good work's being done, and this is an opportunity to go back out and talk about it. Um, from hazards, um, I had a couple comments that, you know, pre COVID, we used to go and kind of monitor about 80 landslides. And a lot of that kind of shut down during the pandemic. Not all of it, but uh, some of it did. And we're going to start to pick that back up because we get out to the field more and get out to do it. That's just a picture I took up in Pace and Canada. Not a landslide, it was a mudslide. But <laughs> insurance companies would call it the same thing. We might not. Um, but what was interesting about that day was that we had three of them on the same day. Uh, Little Conway Canyon, Spanish Fork, and Pacey Canyon. And, and they just didn't have enough staff to get out, so it was a busy day. So, so the state geologists got to go and wander up there. <laughs> and, it, and it's fun to get out and look at the rocks. Um, we're going to hear more about some of this stuff later when Rich comes. We've asked Rich. He gave a great talk to our staff a couple months ago. Mine's like what you're doing. I thought the board needs to hear this. But there's some real active modern going. You know, some more slides you've heard about in the past. Um, and we're still trying to figure out if there, how much money and when and where for this mass like, Yeah, nothing's come out yet on that. Not yet. It's been slow. It has, but we're trying. The state geologists, you know, the emails that I get, they're looking for it. They think the USGS may still direct some money. Because the USGS got a big bump in the new budget. A couple hundred million dollars more than they had in the past. Um, and we're just continuing to do a lot of detailed surface mapping. Um, I'm always interested in the severe fault zones because that's down where I live. <laughs> but the severe fault zone actually starts in Arizona. And we've remapped it as far north as just, I think, just north of Panguage. I, I think if I'm correct, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. Adam believe, thinks he's, we're going to come up into my area yes. this summer. Is that correct? And to try to um, get additional funding and go all the way to the very end. Yeah. So, but what was funded has been done. 
completed. Um, special study, study zones have been done. We'll get a report out here soon on that. But it's on our portal if people want to look at it. Also, has has been hard at work. This is a project you know, involves our geologic information outreach group as well as hazards. But when was the first edition put out? Was that 25 years ago? 2008. 2008. Okay, 14 years ago. So we, you know, you have a copy of that. Yeah, if anybody doesn't have one, I've got a few copies here. But of the current edition. The current edition. 2014. Okay. A nice Pat Bagley drawing. Yeah, there was an update. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that are Salt Lake Trib editorial fans. But uh, there's this new version coming out that we're, we've actually gone through. We've done most of the review and set it towards layout now. Our goal is to get it out online. The great Utah, the great Utah shakeout, April 21st. So, right? yeah. Um, is coming. We'll hope to get online by then. We can put in our advertising and our social media posts. But it's got a lot of good new information. Um, there's a lot of new publications since 14 years ago. Uh, we had the Magna Earthquake since then. Um, a lot of fault zones have been remapped and a lot more information about potential issues. So all that will be in there in the new one. And they're, they are working on maps everywhere. <laughs> I just threw a list of them up there. And so here's one. Remember, I, I said I'd talk a little bit about geothermal projects. We've got three big ones. We work on four still. Um, we're working on one with Nevada and a few other states. And then we're working on this one they call Ingenious. I just thought I'd put it in here. Look. Geologists get really creative and look for an acronym. <laughs> <laughs> and this one was basically it's a big DOE project with, a, with a, quite a few states, but they're going to use play fairway analytics, trying to put in everything they know about faults and springs and seeps and whatever to see if they can come up with some better use analytics to identify untapped resources that may have a geothermal potential. So it's a big project that we're part of, and it, it taps into hazards, and it taps into um, groundwater, and it taps into energy metals. It, it's one of those things that will reach across. Earthquake early warning. This was one of our posts from the from the um, legislative session. We had last fall when we put our budgets together, and we went and met with the governor's office. Steve, I'd ask Steve what would it cost to do a feasibility study. It's probably about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. And so I sat in front of the governor's budget page and says, "I don't care if you give this money to us. Go give it to somebody. I don't care." But the state needs to figure out could we implement because California has one now. Oregon and, and like in the Seattle area have all implemented to some level or another. Japan they've been doing it for a number of years. And so, media piece on with you. Yeah, good. yeah. I'll show the next slide here. Good. Yeah. So we had we worked the governor on this. I worked the Natural Resources Appropriations Committee, and we got this approved by everybody and went to the Executive Appropriations Committee. And they did not include it in their first round on like the next to last day of the session. I was so mad. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was frustrated. Frustrated. <laughs> we made a few phone calls, and it ended up being in the final budget that we got 150 thousand for this. But these are two of the slides that I used about earthquake early warning. And the whole point here is that for those of you that maybe you all know this, but a bit of a recap that you've got different types of waves that come out. Of earthquake. Yeah, a P wave, which is like the least damaging which will show up first. And if we can detect that, then you get a lag for the next waves, like the S waves and the Rayleigh waves, that are the, where all the damage occurs. And so if, you, if that lag is big enough, you have enough time to alert people in that lag moment. And that's what we're trying to figure out with the feasibility study is, the bulk of the money, actually 500,000 will probably go to the U 
to the seismograph station network up there. And so those folks will start to model if we have some breaks on the Brigham City segment or the Salt Lake. And those are the two most likely to, to break in the next 50 years, at least statistically. Um, but if we can model what those lag might look like, and then where are there holes in our seismograph station network, things we need to pick up. Because we got about 85% of the population that lives along, along the west side. Of the we can save lives. We can also save the utilities, you know, if they need to shut up gas or power or water. Um, the Utah Seismic Safety Commission made five proposals to the state. And we sat in on that as well. One of them was the study. One was to retrofit the four main aqueducts coming down the valley. And they didn't. And we thought they were going to fund that, and they didn't. But if you lose your water, I mean, the real damage often isn't the earthquake. The, the economic hit, which in 2018 was predicted to be like $30 billion for a six plus. That's huge. The 5 7 was what, 70 million? You know, we get a big one, we're in trouble. <clears throat> so we're trying to increase awareness. We're going to make that one of our objectives this year is to get that legislature to be more engaged. We made a big effort this year. I, I didn't make it with some of the people that I should have, but I thought I had it done. <laughs> but we got the money. And so that, that was a good thing. So that was this diagram that I showed the legislators. It just depends on where that earthquake occurs, what that lag is, you know. We have one right underneath that lag time to get it short. But if it occurs in Brigham City, we can still get very damaging waves here, but we'll have more lag time, if you notice. So um, the good thing we did is I went to the, when I stepped in front of the legislators, I'm a big fan of this, tell them what the actionable items are you're going to do. And I think that this is this is what resonated with our committees. These are things that we would work on to prove. And we get the 150,000. So we yeah, we hit the media. <laughs> we did um, channel 13 grant for Ben Winslow came, and that was a pretty good piece. Um, Telemundo called the next day, and we had about a 10-minute notice. And we ended up doing the whole thing in Spanish, which was really cool. Because Holly said to her, "Bill speaks Spanish." I said, "Well, wait a minute." <laughs> but because I didn't have any time to think about it, we just did the whole thing, and it was awesome. And I think they appreciate that you can speak Spanish. Yeah, so it came out well. And then Utah Public Radio called that dropped yesterday or night before last. So, and we can turn if you ever want to see him. I can turn my arm and send you the links. I got all these pictures thing. But um, anyway, I thought it was good. We got public notice. Yeah. We get, we get good media focus on that. So make the legislators feel good. Okay, I'm shifting the groundwater now. We're still on schedule, I think. Um, as, as Riley mentioned, these, these folks are busy and we're shorthanded. We've hired a number of techs in you know, the summer help, and we're in the process of hiring more. Um, Different agencies, as I mentioned, you know, Division of Water Quality or our, our Division of Water Resources, Water Rights, they're hiring these folks to do work everywhere across the state. They were supposed to be down in Bryce Canyon doing a sea study this week, but the weather <laughs> and the snow and the cold and the wind will go out the first week in May. Um, I'll go over a few of the projects. Um, Pavon Valley, a new water budget project like we did in Cedar City some years ago, like we did in Ogden Valley a couple of years ago. How much water is coming in? How much is going out? Um, looking at a new project to use geophysics to map subsurface faults to figure out where the water is coming. We've done a little geophysics work in uh, Matheson wetlands because you start to measure um, salinity. If the, the water is more saline, it has more connectivity. Whereas if there's a freshwater spring underground coming in when it comes in, we use some geophysics to do that. So, and again, there's more detail in your notes. So I'm just giving you highlights. Here. Emory Valley, Northwest Price Canyon, Matheson Wetlands, Great Salt Lake, Shorelines Preserve. There's some funding that has been allocated to really ramp up what's going on with Great Salt Lake. 
and we'll certainly be part of that. Most of that funding went to, I think 40 million went to forest fire and state lands. 30 million set aside to go buy water rights. 10 million to do more research. We'll be part of that. That's still being scoped out. Um, the Utah Flux Network, um, Eddie Colbert's Towers, we're actually, I have a picture of one of those. I thought I did, maybe not. It's like a weather station. Uh, we've mentioned this before, but it measures evaporation and transpiration, which comes off of the plants and helps the farm. So we, we're build a, starting to build a pretty good network across the state to help the water people that plan to get a sense of what we're losing and where it's going. Um, and so Paul Incomrad, um, when, when, when I got to, I told you, I asked my program manager for notes. Paul, uh, you, you heard me, so he said, this is a big brag in my folks. So you see each one of those person's names in the right up online. But he thinks a lot of his people, and I think a lot of his people. So, um, <clears throat> and they're going to start to expand a lot of these projects and again do more work on the Great Salt Lake. I think I mentioned before we'd hired from Vision of, of uh, Water Quality that they'd had a person that, that was working on EPA grants and they, had, they were struggling to get EPA grants to keep her busy. And so their director called me. So we brought her back at Downard over here. And I got to tell you, Diane knows how to run an EPA grant. Diamond News, she does amazing. And so we kept back at busy. It was one of those things we were able to work across state agencies and bring people and to keep them working together. Um, Cache Valley, and they're going to start wetland mapping. Anybody here following what's going on at Utah Lake? <laughs> Anybody not following what's going on at Utah Lake? <laughs> Trying to build islands? And, uh, yeah, so yeah, timely. Timely that we're going to begin this wetland mapping project on Utah Lake. Um, Montaigne, that's the project kind of figuring out what's going up in the back valleys and mountains. Paying development grants, and we're doing this big project on the Great Salt Lake over the next three to five years. It'll involve groundwater, energy, and minerals. Some of our energy and minerals folks have been doing monitoring the salinity in the lake, particularly as it's dropped. We've dropped cameras on this on the lake bed. We've got a proposal, it's not ready to send to you yet, but we're trying to get funding to do something called Bathy LIDAR, which is to do LIDAR to fat map to the symmetry of the Great Salt Lake. We don't have enough. We, we, we've got some funding, we think, to do a pilot study, which will cost them between 100 dollars to $150,000 to do a small area out on the west side of Antelope Island. So that's a good one. And I mentioned Bonneville Salt Flats. That's where my pictures are. So Jeremiah starting. But we got all the instruments out, and now it's just time to monitor the data. And Holly was driving when we did this trip. <laughs> we were driving, I said, stop, whatever we got. <laughs> Go and take some pictures. So we got some good ones. Uh, mapping, <coughs> Stephen Kirby is now the program manager. A lot of the work for this year's state map got done in the last quarter. We're going to try and finish that up. Quite a few seven and a half quads have been, been mapped, reviewed other maps, um, several 30 by 60s that we're working on. They're just busy now that the season is out. We're also working on the big map, the big NC, the one to 500. It's not done, it's, um, but it, we're still editing this. But it's a refresh, you know, when you when I worked, you know, I was a grad, an undergrad student, and I took Phil Campbell's hand How How many new hand seat here? Anybody? A bunch of you. Did. Lehigh's method of mapping the state was to take field camp to BYU student summer field camp. I remember we went through the gun lock area, and he'd have you map these large areas, then you look at everybody's maps, and they'd go, hmm, this needs more work. And you go back the next summer, <laughs> you put three students in an area that you did by yourself. But when you start to made all that together, there's some integrity that gets lost. And so 
Grant's had a big goal for a long time to get that integrity restored back into the one to five hundred K. But you, you, you have to give up something. You can't put every little ball. You can't put every little occurrence of the Navajo and every little occurrence of whatever. So they're working on that. So, but they've made a lot of progress on it. Other areas, Deshane and Rush Valley, 30 by 60s. Big part of our funding from state math is to convert stuff to gems, which is the USGS's um, format or data scheme. The scheme is bad, the right word for it. Big to, to deliver to them. Um, but our commitment for this year and next year is really GIS intensive. We've added a number of temporary hires. You've met some of them. Um, so we got about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, noted by uh, fiscal year 23's state map funding. And this is a slide I showed before, except for the upper line. And I started here in fiscal year 20, 2019. I started in fiscal year 2019, January of 2019. We're halfway through the fiscal year. And the amount of money that's come into state map has been huge. And this year, the feds upped it to, you could apply for up to $500,000 in two different arenas. And I'll show that on the next slide, how, we, how it broke down. And so we, we thought, well, let's go for less. We're, we're, we're killing ourselves. That was really our thought. But when Grant started meeting with the other program managers, they wanted to add this, they wanted to do that. We had some mini one for $900,000. <laughs> and true to form, we got about two thirds of that, which is actually much more management for us. But we ended up with about 25,000 more than we had last year. Um, breakdown, new mapping. And so this is, UGS has this new approach is that we've got to get a lot of old data into gems and into usable formats because they have a big goal to make a national map at a couple of levels. One is a subsurface one that I face that no one is surface geology. And so the second half of this funding is, is geared towards those objectives. You know, if we can take a map that borders Colorado, and I'm not picking on Colorado, but we disagree on a boundary, all their maps, let's be honest. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and work out those differences at the boundary conditions, we can start to resolve it. So there's funding for those sorts of things and to take old maps, convert them to gems. And then to, they haven't totally abandoned the mapping yet. They've still got a lot of new mapping, but that's our breakdown. Feel free to jump in whenever you got questions. I'm, I'm happy to, <laughs> to take questions. Um, the part, you know, last time I showed this slide, it said phase two. I highlighted three just so you know there was a difference. And the National Park Service is really only funding one agency across the country right now to help them map paleo. It's just been us. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an article here in a moment that they just published about that collaboration. Um, so Don DeBlue is actually in his camper van somewhere in Canyonlands as we speak, you know, working on this phase three. You know, he did that last year and he's back out there right now. Like I said, we hired a tech to start archiving and updating all these files. And they're working with uh, Marshall Robinson and his group and to make sure that we have it in the right database format. It's retrievable, it's accessible. So it's a good collaboration you know, on, on that area. Um, I remember that's a repeat there. Stefan has also proposed that we do a the 3D print a 3D model of our mega block. So get my, then you can make a cast of it. So like Utah Raptor State Park, they're going to want some stuff out there when they get that built. So we go ahead. And, we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, this is the article I mentioned. Don DeBlue got asked by the National Park Service to write an article on our partnership with them. It's a really good article. Um, and that's just a graphic out of it, but it's available out there. Um, if you want links, again, let me know and I can send links. But Don DeBlue is a lead author on it. It says Jim Kirkland and Vince he works for the Park Service, but Don wrote the whole article. So 
really good notice and it had this national newsletter they put out so at the national level how many of you heard about the damage at mill canyon <laughs> yeah we didn't it made the news in a big way um jim kirkland started getting eaten there was a wednesday night meeting of the friends of utah paleontology out in the Vernal or in the um, moab area and somebody that says i live near mill canyon and they're out there with bulldozers or something damaging everything mm -hmm. and we so jim started getting notices i got notices i started sending notices to the blm you guys got a problem this is going to hit the press <laughs> and sure enough on uh, monday following monday it hit the press in, in a big way that we, we had totally damaged all this stuff out there i went out there with jim kirkland and we met a paleontologist from the blm who came down from wyoming and we walked the site together and so this is what it looks like from the air i popped up the drone took a picture and people were concerned they they have what they call interpreted sites and they used to have walkways anybody been to this site before okay they had wood walkways you remember those they were starting to rot and boards were flipping up in the air and it was pretty disrepair so they they put together a plan and this was the problem is they didn't have the right people in their plan that are required to make this work and it was basically a young fresh kid out of school whose geology background was hired as an engineering tech you know just kind of one of those makings for something to go wrong and it did but the interpreted sites there was no damage on the interpreted sites where the damage occurred was um in an area that this young fella chose to use as a staging area and they drove over a number of things that they shouldn't have driven over and but they were rubber track or rubber tires not even track they weren't track those they were but like back type things with rubber tires and it wasn't real bad the damage but the good news is that they had proceeded according to the paleontologist from wyoming who works for the BLM. if they'd gone any farther with what he planned to put out there it would have done a lot more damage so good news bad news it wasn't nearly as bad as you read in the press and um, but it was good thing they caught it because they can do it right now so anyway it was fun to get out there <laughs> it's a neat site if you've not been there i mean you look at those and you've got like these three toed dinosaurs and you got the plant eater big footprints wandering around on the track there's a lot of variety out there really cool so anyway shifting gears our gio our, our information outreach program they've been again we're keeping them busy a lot of other agencies in the state tap into our gio folks for graphics if the governor had something if you notice in the background at some of the governor's press conferences there was one out on the had a graphic of jordan l reservoir what it looked like in 2019 and what it looks like in 2022 have you seen that one yet <laughs> we did that you know our gio folks are the ones that made those graphics so we're, we're they're the ones that are being tapped in other agencies so you know Mark Milligan and Jen, they have a good group of people that are doing some really quality stuff. There's the cover of the survey notes, which will be out in May. So almost out, almost done. Sitting on my email inbox, Mike, is a, I have to go through the proof and prove it before we send to the printer, but that came yesterday. So that'll get done today. Um, GIO working in conjunction with our data management group has updated a lot of the popular geology webpages. So if you want to go look, you want to go find fossils, or if you want to go find where minerals are, a lot of stuff's been up there. But Jay, did you work on the collector app? That was not me. That was not you. The collector app is something that the field mappers use when they're walking out in the field to gather information. So we know a lot of work that big data. You take your smartphone or your iPad or something out to the field. GIO is also working on some training for non-geology staff. We've had so many new hires. There was a lot of, there was a request, you know, I, I feel for Jody at times. She sits in meetings with program managers. 
we start throwing out geology terms. <laughs> <laughs> the cheese learned a lot. It's really come along. But we have a lot of people that just don't know what, what our vernacular is and what, what is a reservoir rock, you know, what does a sand hill look like? What? So Mark Milligan has been working to put together with Jim Davis a kind of a non-geology program and because again, a lot of our GIS analysts, they just don't have no experience making maps so they can show them geology. And that's just a picture I took with some engineering students I took. Okay, quiz, where is that place? The Wedge Overlook. The well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Wedge Overlook. Who's not been to the Wedge Overlook? Oh, you've all been there. Cool. <laughs> Several years ago, I took a whole group of like 25 BYU alumni, and at least two thirds had never been to the Wedge. Overlook. How does that happen? It's such a great place in Utah to talk geology. We went to the Wedge Overlook uh, with a group of about, uh, I think we had four Suburbans. When we got there, we had uh, 11 flat tires. And, <laughs> and it spiked the road. Somebody had spiked the road going up. Oh, wow. wow. They want to be left alone up there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so we gosh. had a mess up there. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. It's my wall page. I oh, there you go. <laughs> Same, picture. Same picture. Isn't that a great spot? What, what did they spike the road with? Well, they, you know, uh, on the road going up, there's yeah. a couple of places where you cross uh, kind of rocky ledges and right. they drill down to put nails in. Oh, and, wow. And, they wouldn't just throw nails on the road. They, no, they, 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 they were they into the sandstone. I went back and looked at them. They put a lot of effort into that. Yeah. Wow. We used all our spares and got a couple of cars. Uh, I can't remember exactly. This was about 15 years ago. Man. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't come that day. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a, so this is just a beautiful overlook. So this is a group of uh, engineering students who just didn't know a lot about geology. I'm not sure what they got. Um, and our social media is just a hit. I, I don't know how many you guys probably get it. See it? I get it. I have I have colleagues that are in California that send me notes and say your site really rocks. It really good. Oh, every day there's something really exciting. Interesting. Every day. You can thank Jackie DeWolf for that. I'll get, I'll put a name out there. Jackie is the one who works under Jen, and Jackie does a really good job. So our new bookstore staff, you've met Jackson and Tori already, but I wonder how long we're going to keep them in the bookstore. <laughs> they love geology. They're both have geology backgrounds. Um, so we're trying to stagger some opportunities for them to keep them. Jax, I think Tori's going out. She's going to be part of the going down to Bryce Canyon effort. And so she, we're getting them out. She did. She's going to write an article. She did out on that island. Fremont. Fremont. Fremont Island. Went out on her own on a Saturday and some stuff. And Jax is trying to get out as well. We have Holly. She's going to go out to... Uh, Moab next week. Mm -hmm. She's going to go visit some of our rock hunting sites yes. on our web app to make sure that they're there. Absolutely. <laughs> so we're sending some of our people, you know, trying to keep them engaged. So anyway, a lot more print demand starting to go on. Um, hunters come in in the fall. And we, we've gotten, I mentioned this, I think in January, we're getting their art GIS files with boundaries so we can print them on top of those apps. There's a lot of print on demand. You go online and order it. Come by and pick it up if you want. Um, Mexican hat. Mexican hat, yep. And the reason I just put that out there is that we're starting to get to get back out into the public and work with the public on stuff. I've had a few reach out that later this summer that some of the parks are a lot more people to come on talk. Uh, in July, Tim Davis is doing one on Wasatch Mountain State Park. Um, Earth Science Week, we're hoping with all full speed ahead to be back in person again. Here at the core center. Yeah, here at the core center. If you've not been to it, um, <laughs> you can volunteer or you can participate. <laughs> Either way, we'll make it happen. But there's usually between five and 700 kids here. I think the last couple of years. Last year, we didn't do it. Last two years, we haven't. So. 
who are eager to get back and get back in person face to face activities. Do you have a Katie in charge of that or how do we run? Um, generally, it'd be like Mark Milligan and GIO. Yeah, yes, yeah, the GIO group that puts it on. Yeah. And then we get volunteers from across the division. And we get private citizens that come yeah. and volunteer as well. I wouldn't be surprised if we can't get Chitty to come back. He's around. He's around. He probably will. <laughs> he probably will. Fun. The other thing is, we sell a lot of park passes, and I don't know how many of you know this, but the state park passes. They've changed the format. You used to buy a tag, they punch the month of the year. They're going to just sell them on an annual basis now. So it starts in July, or meaning January. It's good the rest of the year, and you have to get another next January. Um, so a lot of people are coming in right now and getting them. Now, if you buy it in July, I know at least this year, they're prorating it for the balance of the year. But you can't buy one in July and have it be good until the following July. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They got rid of guy, and that was a legislative thing. It wasn't state parks didn't want to do that. It came through the legislature. That was in the last year's legislature. I think they did that. But we sell a lot of them, and so there's a lot right now. The sales are really high. <laughs> yeah, park passes in the bookstore. Data management. Um, Marshall sent me a long list of bullet points. I don't have them all here. Again, go look at them, but this, their job, and Jay is part of this group, and we split these guys off so we could be more focused on making sure that we have the right technology delivering the information that's going to be in the best way possible. That's the way I look at it. And so how do we do it? How do we make sure it's secure? And how do we work with other programs to make sure when they generate data, it comes in in the right format? So. When the first year I was here, we were probably like and asked our database person, Martha Jensen. And we got the funding for that. Martha has been really good at collaborating how we get databases built. We stand allows Martha yeah. the star of our or Martha is the star of our group. There you go. <laughs> and, and what that does is that puts data in a format so that when Jay writes an app, there's some consistency there. And there's continuity and it makes it much easier to write those times. And so, you know, we were seeing benefit from Marcus higher and that was a sheet three years ago. So that was a building block that's been paying off. And we're slowly converting older databases over. You know, that's a process. <laughs> we know that, but it but but it's being done. So they're doing a good job. Some examples that Marshall threw in there, and I, again I just listed a few and with like the wetlands app. I just went into it and you can see the color codes there, which ones are freshwater, you know, wetlands, which ones are um, plants or, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of options you can choose. And we, one of the fundings, I don't think I mentioned anywhere, I'm going to throw it out here because um, I don't think I put a slide on it. It may get mentioned in the legislative update by Steve. But Representative Casey Snyder proposed a wetlands amendment bill. I don't know if you guys probably don't follow that stuff. But he wanted to create a central location for any permits issued in wetlands areas that the public can see it. And those permits are typically issued by the Corps of Engineers, not us. And so we were tasked with downloading from the Corps of Engineers and creating a spreadsheet of all the wetlands permits that are issued. We'll post them on our webpage. In addition to that, typically if you go in and do wetlands work, on, I just call it wetlands uh, Bahamas, I don't know. But then you have to do work in that Bahama area to do some, some sort of work. A lot of states implement something called an in lieu of fees program, where rather than doing that work right where you are, you would pay a fee and the state could then choose. They want to go focus a bigger chunk of money on another area that needs, that is more critical, needs more attention or whatever. So we were given $25,000 to do a study on how and what the feasibility would be to implement a federal fees program. So you may know some of that. Rick, do you get involved with this at all? Um, we have some people that do that in our, our office. So get a little bit involved. Okay. We might reach out and ask you guys to, yeah. and help. Yeah. Typically, how many 
permits like that, core permits and things that are issued in Utah? One, I don't think it's very many. I've heard it's only like four or five, oh. but I don't know. Is, do you have an idea, Steve? I don't. Okay, I'm going to do it. I've heard it's not very many. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try and download like the last five years oh, and, and get a bigger chunk that we can make available. But that was kind of a surprise when they came out. <laughs> and it was funny. Again, it's like some of these bills, they, they end up going to somebody else. The, the original intent is they're going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then right near the end, they show up on our doorstep. On our doorstep. <laughs> But we worked with, with, with Representative Snyder on this, and, uh, and I think we got a good win-win on it. So you'll see in his bill, if you ever go look at it, he added these, this obligation to our statutory obligations. <laughs> so the bill turned out to be really long because it lists all of the geologic survey statutory obligation with this one little addition. <laughs> so anyway, um, Marshall, and maybe, Jay, do you know about experiences? I do. Can you share something? Yeah. Enlighten. <laughs> That's the way to think about the experiences. It's an Esri product, and it just allows us to kind of build these apps from a non-developer standpoint. Lance and I being the developers, we have so many apps now, we kind of feel like all we do is maintenance or add new features to existing apps which is fine with us, but to bring a, a new app to the web, to the website, um, we're looking at like Mackenzie and Jackie being able to go into these, this experience builder to make something such as the raw counting web app or geosites, or if there's some other idea that we have. Okay. Thanks. He didn't even know I was going to call it. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> um, funding and budget, and then we'll, we'll get, are we, are we okay to keep going before a break? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it's been about an hour, 10 minutes. I'm, I'll defer to you guys to tell me why. Um, but we, you know, the state came through the pandemic pretty good. There was a lot of fear going in, a lot of fear. But coming out, we, we, they've done pretty well. Um, but it still underscores, you know, some of our, I still think of mineral lease as an unstable resource. I'm going to stand on that on principle for a long time. Even though this year, you'll see some slides here. We came through 150,000 less than we forecast for last year. We'll probably be about a million five this year, maybe. I've got some notes in there. It might be bigger the following year, because with the oil prices, you know. But anyway, we still work on that. Uh, oh, there's my number seven. We've got, you know, we may end up 50% more than we had last year. That gives us a cushion. You know, I say we're, we're in a lot better shape than we were even three years ago. I try to remember our carryover. My first year here was about 200,000, maybe less. Yeah. Maybe less. Uh, that was scary times, you know. And it took some hard fighting. You guys were part of it before I even got here, but but we're in a lot better shape than we were. Um, and grants from the feds continue to be here. Our challenge is match. How do I do the 50-50 match? And so I've got to convince what our, what our big budget that we proposed, Bill and us this last for this, this year, but came out of the governor's offices, we don't want new FTEs. We know full-time equivalent positions. We don't want to grow the government employee base. But somehow I want to get, if they want to understand where critical minerals are in the state and they want to develop them, we're going to need talent to quantify and report that because we're really good folks that everyone looks to for the science on that stuff. So that's, that's our challenge. Um, we've got, the governor proposed a groundwater geologist, an earthquake houses geologist, and 150,000. The legislature just funded one geologist and an earthquake or the warning system, which is good. Oops. If you remember a year ago, Senate Bill 133, which was we've always been dependent on mineral lease royalties from production on federal lands only. 
Because the only money we tapped into from oil and gas and mining was the only funds we got. Everything else was from. <laughs> Senator Higgins put a bill that got passed to take some money out of service tax and create an account for us that they call restricted. And that the there was an equation that would take the equivalent of the last an average of the last three years royal or severance taxes that were paid from both oil, gas, and mining. And then a certain percentage, I showed this before, but a certain percentage would be given to us of that. And so with prices going up, you know, we won't see a benefit yet. And then what happened is that service tax then gets deposited into our account every quarter by the state, but they take out what was budgeted out of general funds. So it's kind of, they're going to replace it. So we don't see a benefit yet. The good news is that if more is earned in service taxes than they actually gave us to spend this year, we start to build a savings account. And we can ask the legislature for appropriations from that excess amount. And you have near record service account receipts the last down taking or it should be. We see it after th three months, we get it quarterly. So we're, have we received the third quarter payment yet? I haven't looked at the report yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just right. But still too early for us to really say we know how much it's going to impact. We're anticipating with the high, as you just pointed out, Riley, that with the prices going up, there's going to be some money there. And if we were desperate or we had a big expense we need to go after, we could, in theory, say next January, ask for a supplemental for this year, or when we do our budget prep for next fiscal year 24, we could ask to take some funds out of that savings account. So, and yeah, again, as it, as it works now, they will only give us what was appropriated. And, right. And you'll see on, um, my report it was 622,000 this year. So they're just they're dividing that each quarter to give us that amount. But as it, as Bill said, as it grows, we'll kind of have to look ahead almost a year, a year and a half to you know fill that extra in our budget. So we get a credit for how much the actuals were, but we only have approval to spend mm -hmm. 622 on a year. So I was really leery on this because it said it was going to replace general funds. I'm thinking after year two, we might really see assume depending again, but if price is crater, it will it could affect us in the same way that Merrill is. The deposits are based on an average, what, three year average. three year average okay. rolling average. So oh, it's kind of year two. Three year average. That's how much it's yeah. allotted to us. Yeah. Okay. We had a big hole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of this fiscal year, they look back to last two years, what was the average? And it came up at 622. Okay. But as that number goes up, 2024 you do it. So, <laughs> what happens is we still get the percentages of the total collected, but we get only get appropriated the three year rolling average. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is where I turn it over to Jody. Sure. And I'll just touch on, um, this isn't in the presentation, but on the materials that were, were emailed out, this is just a history of our grant proposals. And um, I kind of use the, the traffic light, red, yellow, um, and green, where what the progress is on, on those grants. But the what's highlighted in yellow are what's been added since our last meeting. Um, so they're all ones that you've reviewed and approved. Um, and since I set this out a little earlier, so I was out last week, um, a couple changes you'll 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 see is state map three, we have since got that amount now, and so that amount will be updated. Um, what's indicated on this report is what we submitted for was a nine nine hundred thousand. But um, and then we have just this week got uh, phase three C of Forge. <laughs> Which is another, about another hundred and nine thousand, and so with that project, it's been what, four or five years. I lose track. Um, we're now up to about one point five million of funds that we've received on that that project, and that one I haven't added on this list yet. Um, and then 
on our um, on our forecast, if you want to just bring up that top one, I'll just highlight a few things. Um, you can see there that fund um, 1137 OGM um, that operating budget of 622,000. That's that's what we just talked about on the the severance funds. Um, and then right below that mineral lease, um, Mike Vandenberg watches that and forecasts it for us. And so we, we've kind of added a little bit and, and then pulled back, but um, it was originally appropriated at 1.4 million and we're um, forecasting currently at 1.6 million. So we're up this year. He, he thinks that will continue a little bit in the next year as well. And then I just want to highlight the the combination of dedicated credits, federal funds, and transfers, that's basically all of our, what I would call outside revenue through federal grants or transfers from other state agencies or dedicated credits or you know contracts with other ent um, entities, um, not state or federal. And the combination of our beginning operating budget, um, we had about uh, 2.9 million uh, forecasted, which is really, really high for us. And that's really almost unattainable with the level of staff we have. And as we go through the year, particularly in, um, in December, we do a really deep dive and, and I ask the, the project uh, PIs and the managers to really take a good look at where we are on them and what's you know realistic. And we were adjusting our forecasts on revenue as well. And so that's now dropped down to about 2.5 million. Um, so that's where we're at there. On the forecast part, if you kind of go down to where the lower right, yeah. So you can see we're forecasting um, a surplus of 1.9 million. However, we've estimated part of that is set aside for the ground, the groundwater um, Great Salt Lake study. And then that's the uh, 730,000. And then the Bonneville Salt Flats, um, we've, we've estimated um, we're gonna have non-lapsing of about 477,900 on those. So taking those two out of the picture, what we have left for just general UGS operating budget is um, the 738,000. Um, we, we bumped our, uh, authority we have to go to the legislature and ask them for authority a maximum amount that we you know estimate or would want to non-lapse and and we we bumped that up to a million dollars this year because you know several months ago we were looking like we were going to have quite a bit and um with the revenue adjustments down we are now at about um the seven hundred thousand but we have authority up to a million so the, the year last year we were, we were five yeah, we had about 500,000 last year. Non-lapsing. Yeah, non-lapsing. So we, we gave some money back. Yeah, yeah, Which, just a little bit. Um, yeah, so we wanted to bump that authority up and have, we don't want to turn any back. We don't want to go back. And then yeah. again, do the mineral lease. Yeah. Because the last June's mineral lease payment didn't show up until July. Yeah, it's too late to do anything. <laughs> and now, because you're, you're trying to estimate, but you don't know what that number is. It's going to be, and we missed it. Yeah. <laughs> and we had to give some money back. Yeah, not a lot, but wasn't a lot. But we decided we didn't want that to happen. Yeah. So you were going to ask for seven hundred. Yeah, I think I initially put in seven hundred fifty thousand, and then it was during the session we were able to work with our uh, legislative fiscal analyst and get that changed to a million. Which, okay. which just to give us yeah, just to give us. Some, because you can see here, you know, if we had the 750 and I mean, yeah, we'd be barely under, but if something happened, anything over a, a mineral lease check yeah, shows up, <laughs> anything over that, that 750, we'd have to turn back. So it's, it's a hard guessing game, but that's where we're currently at. Um, and then just quickly, I'll I can get rid of this, right? Yeah. You can go back to the other one. Okay. You want me to open this one? Yeah. I won't go too much detail on this because I believe Steve's going to give an update on the legislative. Um, and if you want to kind of, well, I don't know if you want to scroll up, but this is in your materials we, we emailed out. This is just an outline by bill. Um, these are all the funding bills. So this is kind of what I look at are all the bills that combine our funding. 
So we, we start with our base budget um, and then we get supplementals there, the next the purple column. You'll see that 140,300 is what we got for the two positions in groundwater. There's a well, once groundwater, once wetlands. Um, that seems low, but this is because we have a match on that. Um, the other adjustments here and in the base and the revenue part are just um, giving us more authority or just tweaking where we think our revenue is going to be. ISF impacts, ISF is internal service funds. So that's if we're paying another state agency for something. Um, so there's fleet, there's payroll, there's, you know, uh, Department of Technology Services. So they have fees that they charge us for things. And when they change their fees, either up or down, that that's an impact. And so we get funded a portion of that. That's all that is. It's usually really minor. You can see here, 15,000. The compensation bill, um, that one, um, can you talk about that one a little bit? Uh, I didn't go into great okay. detail because I can have a little bit of online here. Uh, raises, I got okay. on that. Um, if I can remember off the top of my head, um, there's a 3.5% COLA. Um, there's some targeted increases, which I think we'll have a slide on. Um, help was 6.7%. Um, slide on that. Okay. Steve does. Yeah, okay. those percentages are all in there. Okay. Uh, SB8. Okay. Yeah, and then um, the bill of bills, that 175000 that is the 150000 for the um, early earthquake warning system. Did I say that right? Earthquake early warning. Earthquake. earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get confused all the time. <laughs> and then the 25000 for that wetlands amendment bill. And so I just kind of put those all together and then so our our appropriated budget next year is um, almost 12, over $12 million. So, and then if you go down towards the bottom, it gives a little bit of narrative um, on each of the bills. So, um, okay. yep. And I think that's all I really wanted to catch on. Um, I know we go into a legislative update and we'll expand on some of these. Yeah, and you already talked about this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll jump on it. Do you, yeah. you want to talk about it? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> occasionally, the legislature targets certain job titles. So these guys are really out of sync in this <clears throat> market. We're never at market. I don't know. Let me start right <laughs> at that premise. But sometimes they view the gap as being so big that they have to make some targeted. So they targeted certain job titles. And so these are the ones that affect our agency. Um, executive administrators, that's like Star and Cheryl. Hello, Cheryl. <laughs> um, bookstore manager, which is Art Jackson. Um, and uh, senior geologist, we have a number of those. And then senior GIS analysts and GIS analysts. So this will affect like Jay. Jay's a senior GIS analyst. So, and the way they're going to implement these is they're going to implement these targeted raises first, and then they'll add the three and a half call on top of it. Now, what's interesting is that as we've gotten more guidance, well, let me back up. We realize this, we may end up with, I've done the numbers and for my agency. And if I give a straight 10% to all of my senior geologists, for example, there'll be some that are near the top of theirs. They'll make more than the senior scientists. And some of them may make more than their bosses. Um, I'm a little worried about that. You know, some people will, will take offense at that. The state has sent out some guidance in the last few days. that basically said those targeted increases are discretionary. And you know, I have a bun bundle of money. So I have 10 senior geologists and I get 10% for whatever all of their salaries are. But if there's some inequities, I could give 15% to one and 5% to another to spread that around to make sure the we try and manage some of the inequities. We didn't know this until I, 
I was in a meeting Monday morning and it came up. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> so my, my plan is to stay still trying to figure it out. And what I've told my people and our staff is don't go spend the money. Because, <laughs> you know, until those rules come down, you know, we, we just don't know how that's going to happen. Um, but the good thing, the good news is it's good for our folks. You know, our intent is to take care of the folks. So, um, and this is where I was going to turn over to Steve. He's got another about 10 slides, I think, on, on legislative summary. So how are we doing? Are you ready for a break now, or do you want to do this and then go to break? I'm going to rethink. How long are you um, How long, Steve? I don't know, 10, 10, 15 minutes off, so I wouldn't let you take long, but I'm looking for a break if you want. Either way, it doesn't matter. I'll leave it to you guys. I'll leave it to the chair. <laughs> okay, let's break for 10 minutes. Okay. Take a break. Oh, and we have uh, John Baza is joining us in the back. He's the director of all gas and money. He's going to be one of our speakers today. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. Have you using your drone license? I have. Yeah. I, I, I mean, not for, I haven't used it. Yeah, I, I haven't used it in the sense that somebody paid me for my work. <laughs> That's the real reason you have to have a license, really, is to get paid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even if you want to trade your services, say your neighbor's going to sell their house, and say, hey, you take your dinner. Don't pick I think it's the thing is to ask my own friend. That's considered compensation. You would need a license to do that. Things like yeah. a deep end and all. I heard oh, yeah, yeah, but I use my drone. Yeah. You know, when we went out and looked at that the site there, I popped yeah. it up. Yeah. If I could get a picture of it. Yeah, I was tricky on your drone. Yeah. Well, yeah. Already, yeah. It's a yeah. 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 It really helps. That would be a neat skill. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Really? <laughs> So not yet. Oh, yeah, show it off. We need to get you one. I didn't know if you guys had one. Someone yeah. has some. I will ask. What do you have to do? Show me your picture. Okay. okay. So that'd be the same trip for a while. There's things that I don't know. Me, you were the first two board members I brought on. I don't even remember. Yeah, I just know that I have it. I don't know how you picture it. I think it will be better. Hey, oh, there's some goodie treats over there as well. No, I mean, like, really good goodie treats. Left over from the box for Linda Bennett's retirement. These have been in the collection. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, String that over here. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Pass it around the table. Set it on the lights. And you have to be there. You go. I'll be right back. It was Linda Bennett's retirement. Oh, too late. <laughs> so they were frozen when we took them out. <laughs> <Wait, laughs> you're giving them the leftovers? <laughs> <laughs> we put them in the freezer. <laughs> you put them in the freezer. Yeah. You shouldn't have told them that. It's like, I came yeah. away from the bakery this morning. Oh, I told them. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch this game. <laughs> but here. This is my favorite. Oh. We can load that up. We can load that up while we're waiting. Yeah. I didn't have any points. Oh, yeah, there's some. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Jody, for this. <laughs> so we just had extra from one of those retirement parties. Yes. I was just noticing, I think your dates might be off on your work. It says the 15th of the 17th. Is that really what you're doing? Is it Exactly. Yeah. Oh, did they? Yeah. Oh, okay. I think that's why. Oh, okay. Oh, no, I just, I wasn't sure. No, I was like, that's weird being on Saturday. Oh, I know. That's fine. Well, thank you. No, you're welcome. Not trying to, like, micromanage. No, no. I thought it was weird. But I have been on Friday, and I didn't realize you guys did. 
So this cursor, when it takes that screen, I know I did. cursor here the track. Oh, uh, the bar wire. Yeah. That must have been like basic I was going to say there was yesterday's. That was a good idea, though, to bring it to the board meeting. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to the left? Um, for, well, I'm going to the, it's a, I have a meeting down there on Thursday. Um, but I figure, like, I'll take a couple of days to go and check out the Rock Hounder app, mm -hmm. which is totally right in my alley because I was always, always like, where should I go look for rocks? Where should I go look for rocks? I didn't know it either, but they were like, well, we're up to, you know, we're up to And I was like, well, that's me. Yes. No, but I'm always like, cool, where can I go? And I'm like, okay, these directions are going to get right. And I'm like, yeah, no, for sure. So I was like, when they asked me if I would help them do it, it was like, Absolutely. And so I thought, well, I have this meeting in, on Thursday in Moab. So I was like, well, maybe I can meet on Go and like do some field work, get out of the office, and then, yeah. So, exactly. Yeah, and now it's like, okay, I'm ready to get out. And I just, oh, wow. You're like, that's a good box. Yeah, let's pop the brakes on that. Yeah. So I've checked it, like, the weather's supposed to be really nice. So it's like, well, Work, I, I gotta do it. So, huh? Hype or bike? I'm um, hype. Yeah. So, but yeah, but it will just be, you know, cool to go and, and look for stuff. Yeah, I'm not a geologist, so part of me is like a little bit nervous. Like, am I gonna know what I'm looking for? But it's like, yeah. I think so. Yeah, because it's like if you're a geologist, do you really need a guide? Yeah. So I'm viewing it as like it's for like the average person. Which I'm the average person, and it's like, okay, like I can find agates, I can find stuff. So, yeah, eight years there, four of our years there, and then we had some more, but you know, I love like, you know, like, yes. I rock, yeah, so yeah, so it'll be fun, yeah. And I'm glad that they're, you know, trusting me enough to go out and do it and not be like, oh, you don't know anything. So are you like, yeah, no, there's actually a, an app that now I downloaded on my on my work phone. But, yeah, but it's um, it's actually called it's um, Collector, which is through I think it's Esri or something. But so I'll be entering data into that that gets uploaded to the actual apps. Pretty much, yeah. So I'm gonna go and like verify like are these directions accurate? Yeah. Pretty much, and like, yeah, well, yeah. well, and so, like, for example, last fall, I went out to this site out by the Silver Island Mountains, kind of by Bonneville Salt Flats. Oh, I know, on the, yes, and so I was like, oh, you know, go look for agate, and so I was out there, and it was like, this site is a complete bust, like, I didn't find anything. I followed the directions, 
And so that's kind of what we're doing. And so it's like, I just let them know, like, this site is nothing. Yeah. And so they were like, if there's a site that is totally picked over, like, let's get it off the app. So I'm like, okay, perfect. Well, there's one. Get rid of it because it was a waste of time. So, yeah, so. Oh, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. To the salt flats. So cool. And, yeah. And the Silver Island Mountains, I've never been to them except for last fall. But it's like, I totally want to go check it out and like do some camping. And it's awesome. So, yeah. Totally. It's like, I'm always, and it's kind of like off the beaten path. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's not terribly Right. Thank goodness. It's like, oh, my favorite piece is like, in Moab and in the swell are so busy now. So it's like, you can meet out and head west. So, yeah. so it'll be fun. Yeah, it'll be awesome. Oh, cool. It's just the QR You know what? I don't even know. I think Honestly, I don't even know what stuff from the Rock Collector app is even or what. Um, but yeah, but I think once it gets on there, it will be yeah, it'll just be like here's here's the site. Yeah. So, I'm ready to get out. And it's been a while. I need to add some stuff to my collection. So. <laughs> it is, yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, good stuff for sure. Yeah. Oh, cool. Like where are you going? How's other you talking? Because you're a biker, though, right? Okay. Oh, oh very cool. Holy cow, I'm sure you saw the dude. I mean, he was a road biker. Oh, both of the road bikers. Yeah. But honestly, that is why. No. I mean, that is exact, confirms exactly. Because it's like, oh, that'd be cool to, like, to get into biking. And, it's, and it, that is a prime example of people just going to too fast, not paying attention, you know, and so it's like, yeah, I don't, I would love to bike, but not on Utah Road, yeah, mountain biking. Oh, even better. Yeah, like pedal when you want to, and then when you're like, I'm going up a hill. The extra, oh, okay. Fun. See, and, and exactly. I would say instead of like ah, getting, you know, eating everyone's dust, but now, yeah. Yeah. Now that sounds awesome. Yeah, I would like to do take up some mountain biking, but I just.
you're up. Well, Bill asked me to give an update on the last Utah legislative general session. Wait a second. Who does not know who Steve is? I think I've met everybody. Okay, just making sure before you get going. I've been doing a lot of the captain's program and also the legislative liaison for the UGS, uh, coordinating with the DMR and the legislature as needed. So, next. So, these are just a series of slides on applicable legislative bills that apply to the survey. And as Jody mentioned, um, this is one of our funding bills, uh, HB2. And this one um, requests performance measures from each agency, including UGS. And these are our particular performance measures that Jody reports every year. And then there's some also some revenue adjustments here and there as needed. Uh, next. Uh, HB3, again, another bill that does appropriation adjustments, and this had 175,000, 150,000 for the earthquake early warning study, 100,000 will be passed through to the University of Utah seismograph stations, and they will use uh, the existing EEW software and current data uh, to model timing uh, availability uh, for various earthquakes and distances to see how long the people would have for a notification. Also to see how the network needs to be expanded and there's additional equipment uh, to do all this real time. And then 25,000 would go to the Utah Division of Emergency Management and they would reach out to industry and other partners uh, like Dominion Energy, um, Rocky Mountain Power, uh, the oil refineries and others to see their interest and their needs in using EW data. Uh, and then the other 25,000 was to implement House Bill 118, the wetland amendments. And have we decided that that's going to go to Division of Wildlife, Bill? We don't know yet. Okay, yeah. I know that Becca and Diane think they can handle a lot of it. Okay. Uh, next, please. And so HB5, as Jody mentioned, is the base budget for the Natural Resources, Agricultural, and Environmental Quality Appropriations Subcommittee. And there's a variety of, of different items that get added into there, including some carry forward authority, uh, some new projects, and other budget items in that bill. Uh, next, please. Uh, HB8 uh, authorizes our UGS fee schedule. Those are things like core center usage, shipping, um, or pulling and shipping cores, things like that. And it also appropriates funds for these ISF ch charges by other agencies, such as DTS, risk management, and DHRM, because we get charged an amount for each employee, et cetera. Next, uh, HB 100, uh, the emergency preparedness amendments. Uh, this bill failed. It would have created uh, the Office of Earthquake Preparedness and Response of the Utah Division of Emergency Management. And this office would have, been, would have been charged to deal with earthquake preparedness and response along with managing a statewide Fix the Bricks type earthquake retrofit program. And the Fix the Bricks program was started by Salt Lake City, where they take uh, a local match and FEMA funding that gets awarded to the city and then through a competitive process, award funding to individual homeowners to retrofit a URM or unreinforced masonry, basically brick homes. And the bill would have appropriated $10 million to fund this office and the match for the Fix the Bricks program. Unfortunately, the bill was poorly presented to the legislature and it failed. Next, uh, probably the most controversial bill is HB 104. The state employment amendments. Uh, this affects all, um, essentially all employees in the executive branch. Uh, it requires DHRM or the Division of Human Resource Management to provide new training for supervisors of employees, and that was defined as anyone that does performance reviews. Uh, it requires DHRM to establish this pay for performance management system, and as part of that, by I made a mistake, it should be July 1st, 2023, requires all state agencies to evaluate and pay employees based on performance. 
and it requires these evaluations and a salary review quarterly. So four times a year makes a lot more work. <clears throat> uh, one item that it didn't do is it didn't provide additional funding to agencies to increase pay based on performance. And then after <laughs> July of this year, it converts all employees in a supervisor position. Again, those that are in or perform or performance reviews, uh, it converts the position on the books from Schedule B to a new Schedule AX, which is at will. And anyone that is already classified as Schedule B before July 1st or June 30th, they can elect to retain the Schedule B status or by July 1st, 2023, they can convert to Schedule AX and receive a 5% incentive, a 5% increase to their salary. And then the last thing that the bill did is it prohibits the Career Service Review Office for those employees in Schedule B from taking <coughs> jurisdiction on a matter that the individual agency has not yet addressed. And I'm not sure why this was added, but it just requires the agency to start dealing with the issue first before the Career Service Review Office gets involved. And I might just add that the 5% incentive was funded. It wasn't funded to the agencies, but it was funded to state finance. And so they'll work out um, some type of mechanism that once they decide who is opted in and, and receives that 5%, how to transfer that funding to the agency. One of the things they also eliminated in this bill, we have a couple of people, I think is one, who has hit the max of her salary range. Yes. So they had something they call longevity. If you stay at that cap for three years, you could get, you could, was it 5%? It's 2.75% every three years. Every three years for longevity. Yeah, so they, they repealed, that. yeah, they repealed the longevity and they also repealed the requirement, the requirement to give a 5%, um, a minimum of 5% with a promotion. Oh, yes. Yeah. You also eliminated that. And so Schedule A, question mark, there are, goes from basically AA to AX. Now there's all. You know, I'm one of them. I don't know which one I am. AD. <laughs> AD, probably. Yeah, you're at yeah, AD. A what? AD. 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 Well, that means I can get fired. They can walk in and say, Bill, it's been nice having you here. Thanks. And so all the Schedule A, <laughs> question mark, all those different A positions uh, are at will and can be dismissed for any reason or no reason at any time. And AX, a lot of people have made fun of that. Yes. <laughs> it is the next. <laughs> it's the next <laughs> coming in the series. Get the axe. <laughs> axe. It is the next coming in the series, but I know. <laughs> anyway. And then Schedule B is just Schedule B. Um, which has some career service protections after the probationary period. Uh, next. So HB 118 is the wetlands amendment, and that just requires that land use authorities, such as cities and counties, uh, anytime they receive a land use permit affecting wetlands, such as these Army Corps permits, that they would provide a copy to the survey and then give a direct DNR which is kind of passed that to us to publish these land use permits that affect wetlands on our website and also requires this in lieu fee program for wetland mitigation. So, uh, House Bill 169 also affects all state employees. Uh, it basically says that in a declared emergency by the governor, it would classify state municipal or county employees as disaster response personnel for whichever specific uh, entity of government, and it requires those personnel to perform duties as assigned, and uh, disaster response personnel may be relocated as necessary, but only during the duration of the emergency. Probably it will not get used very often, except in a major earthquake, it may get used. All our people got mobilized <laughs> on the morning of the magnet. Like yeah, and we automatically do that as part of our mission anyway. So uh, next, uh, then Senate Bill 3, uh, it basically just does some revenue adjustments as needed here and there to, to fix issues that come across at, after appropriations that have already been approved. Next, 
Uh, Senate Bill 8 uh, is the agency compensation, and this provides that 3.5% increase for state employees that Jody mentioned. It also provides that discretionary salary increases for those listed positions that Bill uh, showed you earlier. Um, provides funding for the health insurance and dental insurance, and also provides a $26 per pay period match for benefit employees that are enrolled in the defined contribution plan. And Senate Bill 250 is a mineral exploration tax credit. Uh, it allows those that are doing mining to claim a tax credit against uh, certain mineral exploration activities. It's unknown how that bill may affect the severance tax funding. It was not clear in the bill and nobody's been able to give an answer on that. So hopefully we'll find out soon how that could affect uh, the money that's coming into that special restricted account. Next. And then the last one is Senate Concurrent Resolution 3 or SCR 3. And that was just a resolution that was highlighting Utah's unique rare mineral position based on the fact that we have a variety of critical minerals here in Utah. And it also called for the state to work with relevant federal agencies to promote these critical minerals. And so that's kind of the highlight of last session. Okay. Without going on too long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. And now we are where we're going to jump to John Baza. So we give us a moment to hook John up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop presenting. Have you joined the meeting yet? Put John into the meeting. I will remain in the meeting. Okay. Your HDMI cable. Yep. If my HDMI cable, and I can move over if you want. That table should be locked like this. Yeah, do it again. Do it again, John. Do what again? Hit the present button. Said you couldn't share. Hit a window. Now this time, oh, it's not going to ask. Yeah, you got to go to system preferences and give it. Oh, uh, the, the rights to share your screen. I think it's under the sharing. I don't know, Mac. What would it be under? Security and privacy. You know, I've done this before, and 
The thing I have to do is to save this presentation as a window. So let me see how I can go. Oh, go to slideshow. You're saying display it as a window. Yeah. Go to slideshow. And then, uh, yeah, set up and present it by an individual window. Second option. Sharing screen. I think that's what you want to do. Oh, on a Mac? Yeah, for scarce. Oh. I usually use the third option. I always use the second one. Yeah. Oh, interesting. That one I know works. Oh, I'm going to use the second one. All right. And okay. <laughs> Not for the rest of it. Exactly. <laughs> Right, no, for sure. So, oh, our graphics, our graphics between these max. That's right, yeah. It's, it's easier. Yeah, I think for, from a design aspect. It's like system aspect. preferences, right? There. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. You're going to use Microsoft. <laughs> It share, yeah. Now, <clears throat> system preferences. Click open system preferences. Check next to Google Chrome. Okay. I guess you have to restart Chrome and join the meeting. Yeah, yeah, we don't have everything. Is simple. Are you not going to have a meeting? Yeah, imagine that. Imagine that we don't do that. Yeah, exactly. This is why I use a PC. But for, your, right. but for, for your presentation, we need to see pictures. Oh, yeah. 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 So the, right. So you you could just case. describe what we're That's true. Yeah. So the West <laughs> Takes you three minutes to describe. Right. To get it Imagine this landslide. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm kind of. Why did you guys stop um, monitoring some of the I mean, I'm sure yep. landslides still happen during COVID. They did, but you know, it's. Uh, it's oh, there. A lot of precipitation. Ow. And so we won't have. We won't. There you go. Okay. Good to go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I can see it when we try. I'm going to get out of your way. I know how far you are. Well, hi everybody. I'm John Baza. I'm the director of the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining. I know a few familiar faces around the table. People who are doing it for different reasons for different years. Um, I'm going to introduce myself with a slide here in just a second. But the reason I'm here is Bill and I talk all the time. I mean, at least once a week, but, you know, every now and then we kind of jabber about what our, each of our agencies are doing. And I, I asked if he would be willing to let me present to you, and he kind of did. So here I am today. And what I'm going to try to do is talk to you about what we do as a division of oil, gas, and mining, and what the interactive touch points are with the geological survey. Just to let you know, um, there might be more questions after I'm done about what we do, and I'm happy to address those individually, or you know, give me a call or an email, and we'll we'll sort that out. But um, moving forward, <laughs> this is me. Okay. Um, that was before I had the beard. <laughs> and, uh, my wife is next to me with the sunglasses darkened. That's my mother, who's now 88 years old, and my younger brother, who's 10 years younger than I am. I'm a native of the island of Guam. So that's the first unusual thing about me. But I grew up in Layton, in Utah, since I was 12 years old. Dad joined the Air Force as a young man. I was an Air Force brat. We moved around a lot. We ended up in Lake. Um, so that's the second oddity, is being from Guam and ending up in Utah. And then I went to school and got a degree, a couple of degrees in petroleum engineering. And that's the third oddity, is how does a kid from Guam who lives in Utah get interested in the petroleum business? But it was cool. I, I really liked it. And uh, 
there's a whole other story to that that I won't go into. So I've been the director of oil, gas, and mining since May of 2005. I said in a meeting the other day that uh, I think I'm now the OG <laughs> of the department. <laughs> Everybody I see in meetings seems to be younger than I am. And one thing I can tell you about the last couple of years is I learned how to cook better and I like to eat what I cook. So I gained about 25 pounds. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate. So here's the division of oil, gas, and mining. We have what I call four functional programs. Um, and I'll kind of walk through them. The oil and gas program, starting at the bottom of that list, is the oldest of our programs. The division was established in 1955 as the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission in the state of Utah. And its whole role at the time was to address potential waste and drainage of resource and protect the rights of the owners of that resource, which included the state of Utah to make sure everybody was getting their fair share. It was pretty similar to the Conservation Acts passed in other states, but Utah was kind of a late player in the game because 1955 was when the Hanna field was really, really being developed. And that was what prompted the state to say, we need to have a regulatory system around this. So minerals came on much later. Minerals is based on the Utah Mine and Land Reclamation Act, which was in 1975. And it was a little different in focus because it didn't talk about, you know, how to get the mineral out of the ground, more how to reclaim the land once the development had finished. Um, coal came along later. Coal and abandoned mine reclamation are both federal programs. And in 1977, the federal government passed something called the Surface Mining Coal Reclamation Act. And it um, allowed states to apply to the federal government to, for primacy to have their own coal regulatory programs. And because we did that and were successful in getting a coal regulatory program in Utah, um, we also were allowed to have an abandoned mine reclamation program. Abandoned mine reclamation is designed to use a tax on coal at the federal level give grants back to the states and address legacy abandoned mines, um, primarily on coal projects, but we've been able to leverage that on hard rock mines as well in the state of Utah. So that's kind of an overview of the division. Again, the minerals and oil and gas program are state funded and regulated regulatory programs. The coal and abandoned mine programs are all both federal. So what does it mean to be regulatory? And I'm going to draw an analogy to something I really love. So here's here's a trivia question for you. Does anybody recognize that ball field? In San Diego? No. Francisco. Is it San Francisco? And I'll I'll ask you a question later, which will be the final Jeopardy question. <laughs> So think about baseball or softball if you prefer. It's best to play the game. I mean, people love playing the game. I did as a kid. It's okay to watch. It can be kind of boring. I've heard a lot of people say baseball is boring. But who the heck really wants to know about the rules of the game <laughs> or administer those rules? And unfortunately, that's the role we're in as an oil and gas or mining regulatory agency is we should be putting on zebra shirts with a whistle and a penalty flag, because that's the role we play, is we're trying to administer the rules of the game. In baseball, an example would be, does anybody in here know what the infield fly rule is? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Automatically out. Yeah, and there's some conditions to that, right? I mean, there has to be a force out at third base, there has to be less than two outs, and if the top fly is in the infield, the umpire will immediately call the batter out so that there's no 
in the, you know, they can't drop the ball and somehow get a double play. <laughs> okay. So that's a rule of baseball. And the people who know about it get really excited. Like, oh, it's an infield fly. Okay. But don't, not a lot of people get excited about spacing, pooling, and unitization, which is what we do. Right? So um, this is an interactive map. It's on our website. And I'm actually going to link to our website in just a minute. Hopefully, I can. And uh, see if I can show you this map in real time. So let me see if I can do that. I'm going to have to stop sharing this screen. Oh, here. <laughs> oh, this is going to be weird. <laughs> you got to share that one, did you? Yeah, can you share your screen? I'm going to have to. Yeah, but I mean, let me get to the map first and then I'll show yeah. this. Okay. I wasn't expecting this to be so weird. Sorry. Unfortunately, my eyesight's gone bad as I've gotten older, too. So this is the uh, oil and gas industry in the state of Utah. You can see the information that we've generated starts around 1970. But if you were to go to this on our website, you could use this slider and go to whatever decade you wanted to, actually. I'm not sure I want to do that. I think we can. You know, maybe not. It does play and it's live, so each decade pops up. But if, if you kind of pay attention to, this, to the stuff in the box, it talks about it changes as we go along in the decades. So um, back in 1970 to 75, we only had about 2,000 oil and gas wells in the state of Utah. Let's see if this works. So the slider's going to move, and you can see the numbers growing over time. It also talks about revenue to such a, um, how many people were employed during that period of time. And it goes all the way out to 2020. And you can see there's some markers along the bottom that talk about creation of CITLA, it's not the, I wouldn't call it the great recession, but it was a recession. And then all the way to 2020, when we get to COVID-19. But look how that oil and gas well number has grown. We're now up to almost 17,000 oil and gas wells in the state of Utah. When we started out in 1970, we were just about 2,000. So huge growth in the state. And uh, see, I started as a director in 2005, so maybe I can take credit. <laughs> maybe not. All right, we'll go back to sharing the PowerPoint now. But anyway, there's, there's a lot of stuff on our website, and I'd really encourage you to go to it and visit it. Because like baseball, <coughs> once you watch it, once you played it, once you know the rules, statistics just drive you crazy, right? <laughs> what's an ERA? You know, what's what's the guy's RBI? What's his slugging percentage? Things like that. And we are in an age of big data where oil and gas industry is concerned. So there is a lot of data on our website statistically that you could go to and just find fun facts about the oil and gas industry, the mining industry in the state. Um, you can look up permits. We, can, we, we allow the industry to be interactive and report their production online, get electronic permits from us. So a lot of things you can do with our website. But I would tell you this, okay? Because we're regulators, we don't have the sex appeal of 
you took theological school. <laughs> 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 you know, there are our websites. I go to UTS's website all the time, and it is just a wealth of information to me. I find things on there that I didn't know about, you know, and it's 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 neat stuff and it's cool stuff. Unfortunately, if you go into baseball statistics, it's not that cool. <laughs> and you're not the cool kid because you know how many oil and gas wells there are in the state of Utah. But we we like it and we get excited about those things. So we draw upon the information that UGS develops. We try to insert it into our policy making in oil, gas, and mining so that we're regulating the industry in a proper manner. We're looking at trends. I know I've seen a lot of Mike Denenberg's reports and used them a lot to be able to forecast, well, what can we expect? If tax rules change, what can we expect from such a change? And so that's why how we interact with the information that UGS develops. This is another data tool that we use. This one's internal. This one is used by our staff and our inspectors. And it's, it allows us to prioritize the need for an inspection at any particular oil and gas well site. And these fall in categories of one, two, and three. The ones are red on the map. But an inspector can go into this, zoom in on the area that he's interested in. And the factors that play into what priority is, it's not really the risk, it's just how long has it been since that well has been inspected last? Has it been two years? Has it been three years? The, the longer it's been, the higher it ranks in priority. So it tells our inspector, if there's an area you need to focus on, it's these areas with all the red dots because you haven't been there in a while. Well, that well hasn't been inspected in a while. And is that the only criteria? I'm no, there are environmental factors and geographic factors. For example, how close is it to a body of water? How close is it to population? So those factor into the priorities too. But probably the, the one that is weighted the most is when did you last see that well? Because the longer, longer it goes, the more worry we have that something's going on there that we're not aware So that's something that we use to try to improve our efficiencies. So that's a data tool. Again, we're in the era of big data. So we're using this stuff to try to become more efficient as a state agency and respond to the needs of the regulated industries out there. So when we develop these data tools, um, this slide just says it's not what you know, but who you know. Well, we've partnered with a group called the Groundwater Protection Council for many years. And there is a nationwide database system, and it's got an acronym that I won't explain it to you because it's hard to understand, but it's RBDMS. And out of the, the 30 or 35 or so states that have oil and gas. I'm going to guess that probably 25 use RBDMS. And the neat thing is about it is that Groundwater Protection Council developed this many years ago. And as each state signs on to become an RBDMS user, they get access to all of the enhancements that have occurred up to that time. And then as that state does things like our inspection prioritization tool. As we do that, that module is then disseminated to all the other state users and they get to use it too. They can adapt it to their own needs, obviously. Um, Great Lakes will be different than the Rocky Mountains or the Gulf Coast, but they get to use that data enhancement in their own systems. And so there's kind of a trade-off. I mean, we get a lot of support from Groundwater Protection Council in helping us implement these data tools. But then anything that we come up with goes right back to all the states that are using it. So it's a great system and it's a good partnership. 
We identified some bottlenecks recently that we went to the legislature with. And I'm glad Steve gave his report because we have the same list of things that we're paying attention to up on the hill. But one, three of the things that we asked for, for help with was number one, legal help. A lot of the things we do require a lot of legal advice and counsel. Um, I envy Bill's situation because he doesn't have to ask a lot of legal help. We have, right now we have two attorneys assigned to the division. We have one attorney assigned to the board of low gas mining. And we are asking in this request to the legislature for another attorney. And there's reasons for that. One reason is that they, the legislature just keeps giving us stuff to do. For example, <laughs> carbon sequestration. That was a big bill that came out this year. Um, the mineral exploration tax credits, they assigned that to us to administer. So as these things happen and we need rulemaking and we need to present things to our board, we need more legal assistance to do that. So we asked for an AG and frankly, we got one. But how many attorney AGs do we have? No, we just rely on the others as needed, mainly just for uh, negotiation of terms and conditions on our contracts, it's usually what comes up. We did have an issue with Bryce. Yeah, yeah, they went. They, they skipped the grammar request, which is a request for records, yeah. and went straight to a subpoena. Yeah. So we barely use them, but yeah. occasionally. I, I did use one. Just I'll throw in here, John, if I'm okay. Oh yeah, you bet. You guys approved us doing this landmark designation and pathological landmark designation. I had to reach out to the AG's office to respond to St. George's city attorney on what is this legislation on some interpreting how to interpret some of the legislation mm -hmm. so we actually haven't done the designation yet because it's now costing me money with the ATs. <laughs> but we're working so we, look, occasionally it's a very rare thing for us well and there are things that bubble to the surface for us that consume a lot of legal time you probably have heard about the proposed line on part of this case Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that one's eating our lunch, frankly. It's between responding to all the grandma requests and dealing with the matter in front of our board and the interactions with the operator, it's it's taken a lot of legal time. So uh second bottleneck was staffing. Um even though we are getting more efficient, even though we are using tools to our advantage, um there's just more wells out there. There's more stuff to look at, to do, and to, to oversee. So we asked for more staffing, and we got some help with that. And then the last thing we asked for is we've had such success with our data tools and enhancements, and we were able to show performance metrics that show that success. And we said, let's not let's not cut the knees out from under us now. Let's keep doing these data enhancements. And if, if any of you have worked with software programmers before, you'll know that it's not just the creation of the program that costs money, it's the ongoing maintenance. So that's what we're asking for money for from the legislature. Um, orphan wells is another thing. You've probably heard a lot about this, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, gave the state's funding. But honestly, that arrow shows Utah. We don't have a lot of orphan wells. And that's purposeful. That was not by accident. We have 26 where you're looking at some states that are in the tens of thousands of orphan wells. So the money that would come to Utah is pretty minimal. We're not going to be a big state in terms of how much money we claim from grants to put to the federal government. But we have been managing our idle wells for three decades to make sure these orphan counts were low. And even though I call it a success story, we're not often given much credit for having done that well so that that number is so low. Hey, John. Yeah. Put that in perspective, in terms of production, 
at the country level. You're much higher up that list, right? And where are you? We are, we rank 10th or 11th, depending on if you're talking oil or natural gas. So the point I was trying to make is that if you how much production we do with what our ultra well, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is another interesting fact that I'll, I'll present to you. And these are comparing wells by lease type and kind of the level of new permitting we're seeing. If you look at the pie chart on the left, you see that little red sliver it almost looks like an error line. That represents multiple lease wells. Think about a two mile horizontal. It's going to cross multiple leases. It's not the same vertical situation where you were drilling on one lease type. So the well count on the left shows that as a well number of wells, those horizontals are a really small percentage of our total well count, especially when we're dealing with almost 17,000. But look at the one on the right. The one on the right is permits issued in the past year. And the number of horizontals has grown to where new permits are 20 to 25% of new applications. So that's where the industry is going. And honestly, we're going to have to keep up because even though the total number of wells is still rather small, there's a whole bunch of issues related to horizontals that is pretty new to us that we're doing. And you probably know about North Dakota and the issues with flaring that they've had over the years. Um, that's what horizontals could do to us if, if we're not prepared for it. And I, and I have uh, some slides that will show that. This is just natural gas production in the state, and it shows that the line was trending down. Um, and this is like an 11 year, 10 year picture. But if I expand that just to the last couple of years, the decline was happening but just in the last year or so. We've seen a stabilization of that decline. And you could say that, oh, people are drilling a lot more natural gas wells. That's not true. That additional production is all coming from horizontals and the associated gas of all that new oil production that's coming out. So that'll create some problems. Eventually, it could cause a flaring issue, like it did in North Dakota, because there's not enough takeaway capacity from the wells to handle all the new gas. This is the same thing for oil production. Oil is kind of floated up and down a lot more depending on pricing. But again, we're seeing the same uptick in oil production in the past year because of horizontal drilling. That I don't want to take a lot more time with you. This is a quick chart of minerals in Utah. Um, it occurs in all 29 counties. And unfortunately for us, our minerals regulatory program is the smallest staff program in the division. Um, there's some reasons for that. It's, it's one of those things where, because it's we led on general fund monies. Those have been pretty tight over the years, so we haven't been able to grow that staff very much. We're, we're a bit excited about the, the switch over to severance taxes because now there will be money in the bank that we can convince the legislature, yeah, now's the right time to grow this program, especially if there's a big surge in the critical minerals that's that you have heard a lot about and are real popular to talk about up on that. So that's all I had. Um, it gives you an idea of what we do. And I know that the interactions with the UGS are mainly in the information that we exchange with each other. But we do rely a lot on the good information that the UGS prepares and presents. That's where I'll leave it. So happy to answer any questions. Before John said, we don't just exchange information, we, we share a holiday. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> he's been with OGM for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And over the last year, he has graciously allowed us to tap into different resources. And like I said, John and I, we talk on a fairly regular basis to make sure we kind of understand the shared issues. And, and I'll, if you go back one slide, John, we can stop showing you. Um, just because we have 20 of those minerals doesn't mean that there is active exploration or production on all of those yet. But there's a lot of people wanting to know it to better quant, not just quantify, but qualify those resources. And that's where we will help John's organization as we further down that road with the first MRI funding will better qualify some of those resources. We had uh, Andrew Rookie and Stephanie yeah. give presentations to our board about six months ago. Um, with our minerals program manager. And I think there was there were some eyebrows raised at what was going on in the critical minerals space and stuff. Who needs to know about it? Is there anything to encourage private companies to explore for the 28 critical minerals, or is the um, UGS or or uh, OGM have any plans to, to do some of that themselves? Oh, obviously, with Stephanie, she's already doing that. But um, but is there any way to encourage private industry to, to to do some of that? Well, I know that there's always talk about incentives. I think this mineral exploration tax credit might help to some degree because that'll sell people. You know, if you're spending money on certain exploration activities and you're paying severance tax. You'll be able to claim credit. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Inc. is trying, he's trying to drive a financial incentive. Yeah. But that bill, from a, from a science side, we're, we're spending a fair amount of effort and we're trying to bring in another, as I said, another minerals geologist to, because a lot of the companies, there's a lot of outside companies that come in and they don't really know a lot. And so they come to, they come to us for two things, for something like Stephanie, but also, all these cores back here are not all oil and gas. We have a lot of mining core, you know, the kind of that one inch stuff. We got a lot of that back here as well. And we've had a number of mining companies that are starting to show up to do workshops and to better understand what's going on. So there are some things we can do. And part of it's just being available to provide insights and information as needed. And I apologize. I took a lot more time than I no. expected. To <laughs> we thank you for coming, John. <laughs> Especially when they're saying, you know, like driving on dinosaur tracks and all that. You Thank you. Oh, you're good. He does a lot of pretty rocks and earthquakes and landslides. I know. Absolutely. Okay, this is this is an out of the box question. Where's that? I have a very Oh, that was, it was Green River Formation outside of Green River, Wyoming. There's a hotel up there, the Hampton, right behind it. Okay, let's see. We got to bring up. Rich's talk. There you go, and now I need to share my screen, right? Right. There you go, Rich. I, if you want, I'll just let you advance. Is that okay? Yeah. And I'm going to stand. There's, there's a lot of things I want to point out. Sure. So, I guess I got to introduce myself here a little bit. Some yes. of you folks know me, some of you don't. Uh, I've been here for 25 years, or almost 25 years. Early in my career was all mining and mineral exploration, so that was in Alaska. And then I also did work as an environmental consultant, but wanted to do more technical work and uh, 
really like the environment of quaternary geology and land science. There's a little bit of reschooling to retool myself in that sense. So, but uh, I like land science, as you'll find out, and uh, it, there's good and bad that goes with it in that sense. So, I want to talk a little bit about some of the different types of land science we have, the problems, and then risk reduction. It's not always a good news story. There's a lot of bad news that goes with it, and also try to give everybody here a little bit of a historical perspective and ground things that we do right, things that we don't do right, where we've accomplished things and that sort of thing. It's kind of a steady process, right? Landslides don't happen every day, right? If you get a big earthquake, you get widespread damage over a large area, you get a big influx of funding and things like that. We often joke that landslides are kind of the poor stepchild of, of uh, geologic hazards, <laughs> but, but it makes sense. I mean, if you have a big earthquake, earthquake ha earthquakes are extremely dangerous. I have no problem with that and they need to have a lot of funding, but I'll talk a little bit about some things that are going on at the federal level. Uh, first of all, this is just me, but everybody contributes. These are most of the people who work closely with our landslides, Greg McDonald, Tyler Knudsen, Cedar City, Ben Erickson, everybody in the hazards program. But more importantly, too, this is a program that's been built over decades and decades. So uh, Bill Lund, Gary Christensen, Barry Solomon, going back, Bruce Callister, everybody's contributed. So uh, this is on the south side of the Uinta Mountains. This is uh, May 25th, 2005, to brief low. Uh, this is the U-Bar Ramp, so this is north of Uinta Canyon, uh, Uinta, Uinta Canyon, north of the chain area right there. So this actually started as a sliding type of landslide, it's a snow melt landslide, and then it was so saturated with water, it just transformed to a fluid, and it came down and took out this sleeping cabin and damaged some water lines and sort of things like that. So this is out of the red pine shell. Red pine shell produces a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, landslides. If you look at landslides in Utah, it's like, why do you have so many landslides? You know, first of all, we're the second driest state in the country, right? But we have enough weak rock, okay? And red pine shell is one of those. Uh, we have enough steep topography, the grading to get things going, and we have enough water. So we have all of those. So it's really kind of surprising that for as dry as we are that we do have many landslides. Uh, risk reduction here. Uh, there was another debris flow that came into a campground. Actually, National Forest ended up closing that. Uh, this uh, dude ranch had a special use permit. After this happened, the Forest Service says, obviously, we have things at risk. We need to try to address this. The dude ranch says we don't have the money to do that. Eventually, they went into litigation, and the special use permit went away. I don't know exactly what happened. It settled out of court. Uh, buildings are gone. Uh, part of this area now, a little bit further away, is used as a day-use parking area for Wilderness Australia. So that's it. Next one, please. Okay. okay, so what does this have to do with landslides? So uh, this is uh, Gilbert Munger was a landscape uh, painter with Clarence King's expedition to the 40th parallel, the U.S. Geological Survey. And uh, I like this picture because it shows how our risk changes in time. And I'll use some examples of that, of problems we continually deal with. Munger may not have been as popular as Bierstadt and Moran and some of the other landscape painters, but I also like this because of the artist's perspective. This is very close to where we're at. This is the Jordan River. It's probably close down where the Fair Park is at. So we're looking out, we can see Mill Creek Canyon, Mount Olympus, uh, Twin Peaks. I'll have an example of some problems in Little Cotton Canyon or a little bit later. Uh, but, you know, very tranquil, very peaceful. But who would realize that today we're urbanized wall to wall? We have traffic jams every day. So we have a lot more people. We have a lot more infrastructure at risk and that sort of thing. So those are some of the problems that we're grappling with. And then the state developed very quickly. You know, this is 1869, 1870. Uh, you know, we had copper that was discovered and Bingham Canyon started going, the 49ers rolled through, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, things developed, post-World War II, that sort of thing. So things really rolled along. Okay, next. So we're settled in 1847. You can go back to newspaper accounts as uh, we, we find a lot of landslides in newspaper accounts in the late 1800s even. So we've had landslides through time. Uh, what's at risk changes, I'll kind of mention that a little bit. We really stepped up from a geologic hazard standpoint in the 1980s. We had a lot of flooding, we had wet years. And then also at that same time, our earthquake risk became known to a high degree. And what resulted from that was the Wasatch Front County Geologist Hazards Program. And it still kind of carried on a little bit today. And we also got some earthquake funding from the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. And I, whenever I present things publicly, 
especially like in front of the USGS or at the federal level, I make this very clear because we have hazard reduction that was accomplished by this and it's still being accomplished by this. So uh, when we're looking at getting money, federal grants, things like that, yes, we've had money that's come into Utah and we have reduced those hazards. It's kind of an ongoing process from that standpoint. Uh, the county geologist program eventually went away. Things got a little slack. Uh, we had a lot of landslides in 2005 and 2006. Governor, uh, Governor Huntsman was around then. And he goes, what's going on? We had subdivisions that were being developed where houses were failing before they even got you know, built out from that perspective. He created the governor's landslide working group. Uh, there are a number of recommendations that came out of that. Uh, Steve Pullman had to deal with those more than me since he's the hazards program manager, but Steve did a lot to follow up on those a lot, and Bill Wund as well, uh, the, the, the model geologic hazard ordinance, and Steve just kind of, we just did an update of that recently, uh, and then also our guidelines and a number of other things. So, and also something that came out of that, is, this is, um, everybody here at the board worked with that or through that at the time, I don't know how long some of the folks have been here, is we ended up getting really four positions, right, Steve, long-term? Yes. Out of that, so that, that kind of helped in that sense. So. One of the things that we're tracking right now is the National Landslide Preparedness Act that passed. Some of you might remember the Oso landslide in Washington State, 2014, killed 43 people. Uh, that Senator uh, Campwell, I think was her name, and Murkowski, also in Alaska, they were big proponents of this and got this passed. We're hoping that this works kind of similar to the state map funding uh, projects in terms of bringing money into the state to help state surveys address landslide problems, that sort of thing, or need or something kind of along those lines. So this is something that we're watching and anticipating getting funded for. So uh, next. So not as many as other states, 34 fatalities uh, in Utah. We work very closely. This is not the misspelling of the other word. We call ourselves the State Hazard Mitigation Team as part of the Division of Emergency Management. So. When something goes wrong, I get the phone call at home at night, or Steve does, or whoever, so we're ready to go out the next day. But one of the most important things we do, too, is we work closely with emergency managers and city county planners, that sort of thing. So they don't have a good background in geology. They use their hazard maps. So that's an important step that we have on communicating uh, that hazard. And I'll provide some examples of that and how that works. We'll look at some a few examples of landslides in southern Utah. Uh, both fast movers, slow movers, and things on the central Wasatch Plateau. Uh, a lot of you uh, current board members probably remember Pete Kilborn. He's one that pushed a lot of funding. We're doing a lot of landslide inventory mapping on the Wasatch Plateau. And then we'll move up closely more into the uh, the 90 mile corridor. What is that? Uh, the Ogden to Provo. So we have basically a 90 mile corridor, 90% of the population lives there. So that's, you know, what's at risk? There's a lot more at risk down next. Uh, the Thistle landslide, this used to be one of the most expensive landslide disasters in the United States. It was for a long time. Now it's being superseded by the San Bernardino debris flows uh, around Santa Barbara. That was 2018, and that's into the billions of dollars. This is, you know, roughly $83. So I haven't tried to compare things there. But $83? Yeah, it's 1983 dollars. <laughs> it's not inflated. <laughs> so it's $500 billion. But when you try to compare the two, it's like San Bernardino, they're counting the cost of the fire and other things, not just the cost of the actual landslide and then the fatalities that resulted from that. Uh, but we also have some pretty big slides. This is like a you know 1.2 miles long. This is failing on North Horn Formation, one of our weaker geologic units. So what was done here? Well, the town of Thistle is gone. It was under the lake. A tunnel was driven through Billy's Mountain over here to drain the lake. The railroad had to be uh, realigned, so they put a tunnel through Billy's Mountain, and then US-6 was put over Billy's Mountain. You did a realignment on that. So that's kind of, you know, a big disaster, a lot of funding that comes in, and then what ends up being done in the end. Next, please. So this is just a graph. Even though we're a dry state, we still we still get some pretty good sized landslides. You can't really compare things. This is Mount St. Helens. Uh, this is the Bingham Canyon mine landslide, really big volumes. But when you get to some of the other uh, landslides in the Western US, uh, the Gravant landslide in Wyoming up by Grand Teton National Park, the Madison Lake or Earthquake Lake uh, landslide from the Hebden Lake earthquake. But here we have the Manti landslide, the Thistle landslide, 12 mile, 
And these are even quite bigger than the Oslo landslide in, in Washington State. So we still get some big landslides. I want to show you a couple examples of that uh, and their impact on the on the environment, that sort of thing. An important point is, is that historically, boy, probably at least 95, closer to 98% of all the landslides we work with are pre-existing landslides. So if you map pre-existing landslides, you have a good idea of what that hazard footprint is and where you can anticipate things going wrong. And that's the purpose of this slide here. Uh, this is, uh, you can see some of the 12 mile landslide right here, but here you can see it here when it moved in 1983. So big landslide, two and a half miles long, right? It's a roadless area, it's on Manti LaSalle National Forest. Uh, debris flow came off of this guy, just off a piece of it on the end, went through the Pincho campground down lower that they closed the 12 mile canyon. And so we go from 1983 to 1998. Then we have another landslide that comes in here at the North Fork of Cooley Creek and the damage that it caused. So in this particular case, because it's a roadless area, most of the impacts are water quality and then the people who use the water out in San P Valley. Next, please. Mm -hmm. So this is just a change. This is a 12 mile landslide is in place. Next slide. So you see how disastrous this is. This is the <laughs> North Cooley Creek coming in. Uh, this upper part right here is a little bit over a mile long. Uh, but you can imagine here, uh, there's up to 30 feet of deposition of sediment. So the creek is trying to work its way through this. You're creating all sorts of sediment flux down lower that's going out into the Mesa Verde sediments. Or pardon? Mesa Verde sediments. Uh, excuse me. All this is all North formation. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, all, all north north. So, in fact, it's probably the bell winner for our total landslide count <laughs> in the state. So, next slide. And this is just, uh, okay, and then the next one, this is just looking uh, downstream. Next. And so, so this stream here in the North Fork of Cooley Creek in 12 miles is basically working through about 1.3 miles of sediment. It's been deposited in along the creek there. So uh, a lot of sediment flux out into the valley. Irrigators had a lot of problems. Uh, the North Horn, there's a lot of clay in it. You get a lot of suspended solids, suspended sediment, uh, and they can't settle it all out. So it ends up eventually settling out in some of their sprinkler lines and things like that for the agricultural production out in San Pete Valley. Um, this is an example where that was the only response to that. Some of the farmers actually tried to look at like, well, we don't, you know, can we stabilize this landslide? And they wanted to divert water off of the North Fork of Cooley Creek, but they were going to, they didn't know what they were going to be diverting land, water onto another landslide. So I don't think that's, you know, <laughs> in this landscape, that's probably not the best thing to be doing. But here again, you just know that you're going to anticipate more problems. When you look at the Wasatch Plateau, not every canyon, but you have uh, Farron, Manti, Ephraim, uh, Sealy, these all have big sliding, slow moving earth flows like this. They're fairly common down there. Next, please. So now we're going to move from those to uh, fast mover rock falls. And uh, this is some work that uh, Bill Lund and Tyler Knudsen have done in the town of Rockville. And this is just showing the frequency of some of the different rock fall events in this particular case right here. The red, of course, is the high hazard area. When we have areas like this, it's always good because it keeps us calibrated if our mapping is accurate or if we need to change any of our methodology uh, and that type of thing. So here we are. Uh, one of the things about rockfall hazards, at least for the, uh, the public or the non-geologic specialist, is probably one of the easier hazards to recognize in the sense that, you know, they are building houses in and around rocks, right? So at least from that perspective, at least knowingly or unknowingly, they're accepting that risk. So here we have two different problems. We have this very resistant Shinnerup conglomerate that sits over the soft low and copy shell, and then the, the rocks that are here. And I'll show you some examples of what we're trying to do from hazard mapping and a land use planning standpoint here in a couple slides. So uh, next, please. I, I'm gonna, I've got to make a comment here. I, I've been out. I, I, I wonder... When you built this house, how did you think that rock got there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? No, it's, it's, a, it's a good and, point, and you know, but as humans, we have incredible powers of denial. We do. <laughs> it, it won't happen on my shift, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's a good point. <laughs> you know, you got this yard art there. And people think, I'm just going to get a little geeky, but it's the no. run out on that. The run out on that is where the big boulders stop. And people continue to build 
you know, the rental limit. I got called in by a law firm to look at one in Ivins. <laughs> and the builders built inside the rental limit. They got this beautiful rock yard art out there. How to get there? Anyway, I'm sorry. Okay, go well, next slide. Go, go to the next slide. So, uh, this is an example of what happens. It's very unfortunate, but if you just keep your eye on the gable of this particular house, we'll go to the next slide. Oh, so this is the December 12, 2013 event. Uh, two people were killed. Steve worked on emergency response on this, along with Tyler and Bill. I wasn't in on this one, but uh, likely triggered by a freeze. Uh, when you think about these rock wall problems, though, the rocks that are on the slope are conditionally, they're always being conditioned, right? You go through freeze thaw, you go through warm cold, and they're always kind of being conditioned to just roll off or pop off. And it's not, it's, it's very intermittent, it's very sporadic, it's very hard to predict in that sense. But we do know that when we see these actual boulders and things out there, that that's a good footprint. You know, from a hazard standpoint, that gives us a way to measure things and to rank the hazards. Next, please. So this is an example. This is some of Bill and Tyler's work down uh, in the St. George area. Uh, this is one of their hazard maps. The, and here, the red is looking at the high rock ball hazard area here. This black line is associated with the special study zone on the vault here to the left. But you can see here, this is the Cottom Cove subdivision. It was flagged by the Hillside Review Board. This is the idea of having hazard maps in place that the local governments can use to strategize their planning. So next, please. And this is probably one of the most important things we do is this ability to communicate this hazard to the, the Hillside Review Board or the Planning Commission or whoever it is, and also working with the developer, their engineer, their geologist, and the city officials on coming up with a compromise. So if you look at something like Rockville, uh, you might have a house that's worth a few hundred thousand dollars or even seven hundred thousand dollars, but what would it take to protect that house from those rocks, right? Well, it becomes economically unfeasible. And so what often happens is that we do have hazards where we have problems, we address it and we mitigate it. But often when we have things like Rockville, there's no solution. So we really go back to the pre-event risk level. That's all we're doing. We're not really reducing the hazard. Uh, we might have reduced the hazard in a sense that a house is gone, people are deceased, they're no longer living there, maybe they won't buy that lot, build on it, that sort of thing. So this is a situation, if you take Rockville, you'd just be putting it back in here. And that's what was actually proposed in this individual subdivision. If you go to the next slide, you can see how high the lots were pushed just to shoe in, shoehorn in, as they say. Every, you know, developers trying to maximize his, his or her profit. So, and the situation from that standpoint. And that but red it, line is the run out. Yes, yes. And so in this, in this particular case, uh, they ended up eliminating 12 lots and then they did, what is it, site-specific recommendations on the others in that sense. So it's not that we, we still have plenty of examples. Ivan, St. George, Washington City, we can just go on and on and on. And in the future, you will hear about rock poly events there. It's undoubtedly going to happen. We're, we're just, we have elements that are at risk. That's all there is to it in their houses so, from that perspective. But these are efforts, these are measures that we try to do as a survey in terms of preparing hazard maps, getting that information out there, uh, and especially you know tying that in with geologic hazard ordinances and that sort of thing. Next, please. Okay, so we'll go on to uh, some debris flows here. I, uh, so that last one was actually the Cayenta uh, sandstone on, the, on that Cotton Cove subdivision. So debris flows are one of our more frequent type of landslides that we end up working with. Uh, we have 175 year history. Same thing, you go back to newspaper articles in the late 1800s, you certainly hear about them and see them. Our elements at RISD are different. You know, we used to have damage to agricultural lands and things like that, but now they're running out into subdivisions. We had a lot of overgrazing with uh, uh, on, on federal lands that ended up having a lot of debris flows that happened in the 1920s and 30s. They're no different than fire related debris flows. You can go back and look at Journal of Forestry reports. The landscape is diluted. There's no vegetation on it, that type of a thing. Uh, 1980s, we went through a big period of what years there and flooding, a lot of debris flows associated with that. The 2000 to 2005, 
was a dry period where specifically we did a lot of work on fire related debris flows in northern Utah here uh, uh, with, with the hazards program. And we have 15 fatalities. And one of the important things here, out of those 15 fatalities, 13 of those are in campgrounds. So you, you just don't have time to get out of harm's way. This is the, uh, uh, up here, this is a 1923 debris flow at Willard. Uh, this is one of those fatalities. This is in Sheep Creek. There's a geologic hazard a tour that goes there. This shows you some of the aftermath. This was a snow melt related debris flow. Next. Okay, uh, we hear about these every summer. We have a drying climate. <laughs> we have a lot of fires. It's going to occupy a lot of my time here for the the, ne the next six, seven months. Um, I'm part of a post-wildfire post team that works with emergency management. But what people don't understand is, is that what's up here is going to end up down here. This is just a, a photo up above Provo where we're doing a post-fire assessment here. This goes to show you how some of the debris flows are triggered intense thunderstorm rainfall, and the ability, even with sheet flow, some of, the, some of the large rocks that are moved. So this water runs off, it gets into a channel, it has rock with it, and then the energy of all that water just starts eroding material. So 90, 95% of what we see comes out down here on the alluvial fans at the mouth of the canyon. Canyon is eroded from the channel. And then these are just a couple of other examples from last summer, a couple of debris flows that I worked on uh, north of Duchesne, south side of the Uinta. This is Rock Creek, just below the upper Stillwater Reservoir, that area right in there. So uh, close the road for a couple of days is kind of a shared county. Uh, forces. Uh, this is 2002 in Santa Quinn. This shows you what it looks like where you developed on alluvial fan, you get a fire, you get a brief flow, and the material comes out. Uh, one of the things that the people have a hard time understanding about debris flows is that they're they don't work like floods. You know, they're they're viscous. They're a viscous slurry. You know, uh, a cubic foot of water about the size of a basketball is about 64 pounds, something like that. A debris flow of that same volume is going to be about 130, 140 pounds per square foot, per cubic foot, excuse me. So just because of that density, they have the ability to carry really large rocks and it can have much greater impact pressures, that sort of thing. The other thing is, uh, that's important is that debris flows surge. As they come out, it's not one smooth uh, trip out the canyon. They also get, they frequently get blocked and that blockage will break and you'll get a big surge of this wet concrete coming out onto the alluvial fan. And as it does that, things tend to evolve. You know, if you were going to take this, this debris flow should have gone straight down this road. But you probably had a pulse of sediment that came off, came out, and then you had another pulse that deflected off of that and went down through the houses, that sort of thing. So next. Just goes to show you some of the nature of the damage in the subdivision. Uh, the mitigation that was done here, and this is very critical for a lot of communities that don't have infrastructure in place for a risk reduction standpoint, is to try to get a bond or a mill levy or something to build a debris basin. In this particular case, they built a deflection dike to divert it to a sediment runout area. And then you put it recently? Pardon? They put houses all above that dike. Yes, well, that, then there's another one down to the south there that, yeah, it's, that's, that's actually a different tributary, so. Uh, I was going to say, uh, but then there are other measures because we have so many fires, this comes up, you know, the fire gets put out, they make the firefighters cookies and everything, and then they leave. And then we post fire team comes along and says, well, now you got a flood and your roof flow problem, you know? <laughs> and so then you have to start working on that. There are measures like flood insurance, which helps eliminate the loss or evacuation of the neighborhood. We've had a couple instances where that uh, they've worked with the National Weather Service on early warning. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but there's there's some problems associated with that. But we try to do everything that we can to eliminate that risk. It's best to look long term, and uh, there's going to be a debris flow that eventually comes out of that canyon or flood. That's how that alluvial fan got there over time. Next, please. Okay, now some of you guys were here in 2014 on our field trip. On a board field trip, is, were you here, Ken, then, or maybe not? Okay, so I'm not duplicating this then in that sense. So this is actually uh, off of the Sealy Fire in Huntington Canyon. This is the Lower Bridges Campground. And uh, this is one of the ones that's made a liar out of me long term. <laughs> uh, uh, so the fire was in 2011, okay? And as a general rule of thumb, both ourselves in the U.S. Geological Survey, we say 
Well, the risk is going to persist at a real high level for about three or five years. And most, most drainage basins, we get enough regrowth in after three to five years that we don't see many reflows, right? Well, sure enough, I'm wrong, right? So we had the Bear Canyon flood August 5th of last year. There was a coal miner that drowned at the Gentry Mountain coal mine down yeah. by the power plant. That same storm triggered another debris flow event here oh. 10 years later. Surviving. So, so you can't say that you're totally out of the woods. Uh, risk reduction here, uh, this, there's two parts of this campground, an upper and a lower. This part is now permanently closed. And they had to kind of reroute the road to get into the upper part. So they were still able to use some of the campground. But I think this makes it painfully clear. And after the fire, we worked a lot with the Manti LaSalle National Forest. And some of the early debris flows they had were not. <laughs> they weren't moving big rocks like this, right? You know, and it's kind of like, well, you know, they'd get muddy, you know, maybe the car would get stuck or something like that. It's like, no, that's just too unpredictable. And the fact that we have that statistic of people dying, I, it really helps to, to communicate what that risk level is, you know, from a land management agency and what they can do. So um, they're, they're unpredictable. So if you think you totally understand them, you don't. From that perspective. So that's the risk reduction measure that was done here. Next. Ah, John's gone. But this is my trick slide. This is a quiz, and you're supposed to figure out what's wrong with this picture. Bridge is nowhere. Bridges. Bridge isn't on the river. <laughs> the water isn't going under the bridge, is it? Okay, well, you guys got that. You guys are good. You're paying attention. You're not asleep. So, uh, so this is a debris flow out of Mill Canyon. And, and uh, on Huntington Creek, this is State Route 31 here that was continually closed. You can see some of the aftermath of the fire. But this is a case where the debris flow came all the way off the end of the fan, into the creek, totally filled the creek up with sediment, and now the creek's running around the, <laughs> the, the bridge abutment in that sense. So, please. Okay, debris flows. Um, we don't have to have fires. And I mentioned earlier on in that landscape painting, I talked a little bit about Little Cotton Canyon. And when you look at where we live today and our population and our highways and our urban canyons, our elements at risk have changed and how fast and how quickly some things can change. So, so on August 8th, about eight o'clock in the evening, we had a rainfall that triggered debris flows and floods that closed SR 210 and Little Cottonwood Canyon. Okay, uh, road was blocked, people were trapped at Alton Snowbird. Uh, Governor Herbert declared a state of emergency. In that amount of time, we trapped 35 vehicles along a four mile stretch of highway. Okay, uh, a lot of damage to the highway, uh, utilities, uh, and multiple agency response. Yes, we've had debris flows here before. One of the problems right here that happened immediately after was the good and bad of social media, right? Emergency response. We had every, they had everything from fatalities to injuries to you know just you know debris flows have happened, right? So if, so they were lucky enough it was still daylight. Public safety got a helicopter, flew it. Most fifty percent of what they were getting from social media wasn't true, but the road was blocked, and that was that. People were trapped. That sort of thing. This is Elisa Falls, a little further down in the canyon at mile post 6.7. This is the, more of the true thickness of the actual debris flow right here. They're trying to dig out some of the culvert with a backhoe. That's why that's piled up there. Um, next slide. So on that landscape painting, I pointed out Twin Peaks, which is right here, uh, up at about 11,000 feet. And even though you drive up the road, you don't really realize it. but. When you look at Lisa Falls, it's not a big area, it's about a square mile drainage basin, but there's 4,600 feet of relief there. When you're driving up through the trees and you really don't understand what's going on. So uh, Tanner's Gulch, I'll show you some examples of another debris flow there that came out, not quite to the road, but some flooding damage to the road. It's a little less, this is about 0.6 square miles. Uh, but when you look at these drainage basins, you see how rocky they are. You can see the contact between the Portland's Monzonite and the big cottonwood formation up above that. These, these drainage basins are just kind of perfectly situated to take rapid rainfall runoff, concentrate it, send it down the channel, erode big rocks out of it, and block the highway. You know, just, just as simple as that. Um, in terms of the mitigation here, uh, UDOT got rid of uh, the, the pipe type culverts, the galvanized culverts. They put in box culverts. They also put in grates to make them easier to clean out. They put some wing walls 
that if the you know if the culprit plugs rather than eroding a road, they try to send the material down the ditch and that sort of thing. The other thing that they've done is that because these highways are highly instrumented uh, for a number of reasons for snow plowing and avalanche control and everything else, they didn't have any precipitation gauges in along the highway, so they've installed those now. They've tried to work with the Weather Service a little bit on early warning because the Weather Service and NOAA, they do flood forecasting, flash flood forecasting, but this particular canyon is poorly situated because the radar sits, if you think about it, it sits out by Farmington Bay Wildlife Refuge, right? So we have an 11,000 foot high mountain here that's basically blocking where the radar can't see. So unless your precipitation is coming from above 11,000 feet and you're getting returns on that on the radar, you know, then they can warn. But this particular storm was lower elevation and they can't see what's coming out of the cloud. So they, you know, so it's, you're kind of limited from that standpoint, but they still do the best they can. So uh, this particular road, you'll see nice alluvial fan, nice alluvial fan, nice alluvial fan. These are all alpine type of environments. Another one, this is actually a rock avalanche deposit that dates back to about 4,000 years ago, about at uh, White Pine uh, right there. But so this isn't the first event. It's not the last event, so we'll hear about them in the future. Next, please. Uh, when we were doing the, uh, uh, the briefing at the Emergency Operations Center up at the Capitol, this is one, and I had this slide. This is a natural gas pipeline. Okay? Oh. And it's one of those few cases where the, the town marshal who was running things for Alton, who was running things at the top of the canyon in emergency response, he came up to me afterwards. And, you know, police officers, they see a lot of bad stuff through their career, but he was just, like, very serious. He says, if a rock would have hit that and sparked that, he says, we would have been, I won't use the words you use, so screwed, basically. <laughs> uh, he said, we had a campground that was 300 feet away. The road was closed to Snowbird. The road was closed at Lisa Falls. We had no way to get a fire truck there. You know, and he, he, you know, he was just like, I got to retire before this happens again. <laughs> that was kind of kind of his perspective, but it goes to show you where you have certain elements at risk. These are rocks that have actually been pushed off the road to open the road uh, after the event. You can see it's worn off all the cathodic protection and that type of thing. Uh, other debris flows: Montecito in California, the debris flow that uh, killed there were several, but they 23 people died. One of the things on timing of when those debris flows hit is when people started calling about the fire from the natural gas line approach, that sort of thing. So in terms of going back and reconstructing the timing of everything that happened there. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that was Tanner's Gulch. We're going up a little bit higher. What we saw on the highway was just water that was coming out the tail end of the lower part of the debris flow. There's Ben Erickson, there's Adam Hissock, two of our geologists in the hazards program. Goes to show you the size of rock that debris flows could move. And what you really need to understand, it goes back to that viscous slurry, right? You know, a lot of people would look at this. The subsequent rainfall washes the mud off the rocks, you know? And so they kind of think, well, it must have been one hell of a flood, you know? But if that was a flood, to move bed load like this, your flood line would have to be way up here, right? You know, it's just hydro hydraulically, it's not going to happen. But uh, uh, it goes to show you some of the size of rock that can be moved. Next, please. So we took our drone up and uh, we, it's not me, <laughs> it's the younger guys that fly the drone. Uh, but basically we did a comparison from the 2006 LIDAR to the 2019. And there was an event in this uh, drainage in 2013, you can see some of it here, but when you look up here, you can kind of see how much is even added in, to the 2013 on the right hand side of the web here. And even though it's pretty coarse going from our uh, digital elevation model to the 2006 uh, LIDAR, uh, we have anywhere between about two to three meters of material that was deposited in here. Uh, next slide. How, how close are you from being done? Say what? How, how much farther before you're done? Uh, I'm just a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is what the inside of that looks like, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can see the viscous nature of that from that perspective. Next. And this is the last uh, little spot that I have. Uh, Rick has actually done some work on this. He actually had a landslide instrumented in the Dane Bain field before. He... Uh, yeah, that was up on 425 East. But this is another example of urban encroachment. Uh, this is the Weaver River Delta. 
is Lake Bon all Lake Bonneville sediments going from the Bonneville level to the Provo level. We've cut down and left a bluff here on both sides of the delta, produces numerous landslides. We have the Weber Davis Canal that runs along that from that perspective. The canal's done a lot of work to uh, reduce their risk. I guess is probably what the best way is to say that. Next slide. And this is just one example here. This is a landslide in uh, 2006, broke off the top of the slope. Uh, the canal sits right here. They had it in a bulk scovert at that point, but then broke through the back of the house, injured a child, uh, that sort of thing. Next slide. Another one we've been working on here recently, uh, one of Ben Erickson's. These are different LIDAR flights. These were done by the county, or excuse me, drone flights that were done by the county. But we're glad it's too hard to get clearance because it's close to Hill Air Force Base. That sort of thing it goes to show you the growth of this particular uh, landslide uh, in time. Next, some okay. of those homes have been torn down since, right? This yeah, is, this has been yeah. torn down. I think. Yeah, that, that house is gone. Four homes is. are gone. Yeah. Four homes. Yeah. Uh, so this is it. In summary, you know, one of our big goals is to map an inventory landslides. You have a landslide on the map. It's hard to ignore it from the developmental standpoint. Of course, there's investigation of it. You know, enforces uh, uh, good good decisions and good development. We're always trying to get the information out through either a landslide database or maps. A continual thing that we have to do is educate public and elected officials, like officials come in and go out of office. So we're continually doing that from that perspective. We do everything we can to implement geologic hazard ordinances so that any maps get used and go through review before we put uh, people in houses in harm's way. And we're really just trying to reduce the risk to life, property, infrastructure, reduce economic loss, just wise, sound economic uh, uh, development and sustainable development. That's what we're really trying to do here. So I'll leave it at that. You can ask some questions if you want or if you need. But that's kind of the, no, oh, there you go. This is all, this is a Toto. That's our landslide dock. <laughs> <laughs> Old technology. <laughs> so that's it. Um, but I wanted to give you kind of a context of things through time a little bit and then how that risk has changed through time. So, we, you know, with our growing population, we, we, we uh, still have a lot more of this all the time. So we're pushed on to steeper slopes and more population and more infrastructure. Risk, so. Thank you, Rich. Yep. Any questions for Rich? These guys do some amazing work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's other things I could have shown you. We have other research that we're doing on long term, so moving landslides and things like that. All sorts of technological uh, things to try to stay abreast of the latest technology and help out and buy new things to <laughs> do a lot of GPS monitoring and our drone work now, things like that. That's, that's a slight hint. Yeah. You said an email about equipment this morning. I don't know if you know that. No, no, I, I, I asked, I've asked these. All the program managers put together. We did this two years ago. Remember, we did a wish list. You know, we're so far behind. What do we need? So now I'm starting starting to trickle in to Jody and I. Not a week goes by. I don't think the last several weeks where we haven't had. I'd like you to consider. <laughs> I would like to get. So I've asked all the program managers to put together a list again, and we'll see what we do. And we'll prioritize it. That's it for us, I think. Let's see. Um, not presenting that. Will this be made uh, available electronically to the board members this presentation? We can certainly do that. Yeah, if you like, I gave a longer presentation uh, about Utah landslides or the USGS landslide seminar in this fall. <laughs> Uh, parts of this are in there, but I'll give Bill that link, and that's available online as well. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I was I, I didn't get the chance to show this earlier. Fun fact of the day. This was just kind of a fun thing. Oh, come on. Uh, there's some accounting. <laughs> I thought that was funny when I saw this. Yeah. Saw this a few weeks ago on some news article. I saw this. Did you see this? Yeah, I saw this. 
I thought that was really where weird. was it printed? I was trying to remember. Was it? I, it's amazing that this thing showed up somewhere. Yeah. So I grabbed a picture of it at the time, uh -huh. and I had it stuck away. And I thought, I'm going to show this. <laughs> it is something kind of you thought. I would have thought it would have been carving kind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you got the old Bible Belt, the you know the blue states where you couldn't buy them. You can. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Dry states down here. I mean, those coal anyway. miners like to swill their beer. <laughs> so anyway, that's my closing slide. Crystal guys, crystal guys. So it's fun to get out there in the winter, more so than the summer. I don't see it erupt anymore. So that's because they filled it up with so much crud, and it's really slowed down how much they've done. It still erupts, but it just kind of flows. Guys, right now, but uh, it had erupted not too long before, and so is the roadside geyser still erupt? No, has it for years when at Woodside? Yeah, I've seen, I used to uh, once in a while see it erupt yeah. when I was driving by. And that one, they had, I'm told they had like an air compressor and a and a line they ran. Oh, oh really? Uh, I, I thought so. it was just CO2 and the water dropped <laughs> back in and pretty soon it built up. Joke's on you. <laughs> I think there was a little of that, but I think it had had some uh, motivation. Yeah. A little of <laughs> a lip pump, so you see. <laughs> so I think that ends us. Do you have anything else for us? Um, just that we'll be getting the proper information, more information. Yes. And then June 9th is the uh, lunch at Canyon Park, and then August 10th is our next meeting. Correct. Okay, that's all I. That's yeah. all we have. And, and Holly asked me one question. I had put on my calendar that the board field trip would be 15 to the 70, which is a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. She goes, "You guys going on a field trip on Saturday?" I think that we chose it that way, if I remember right. We come back on Saturday. That's what we've done the last. Yeah. That, is that right for you? That means I have my calendar. Okay, me too. I just, I said that's what we planned. She goes. <laughs> I just thought I'd verify with the rest of you that we were on track. Okay. Okay. Then it is 11:47, and it um, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, we kept.